Hey guys, and welcome to a brand new tutorial series on neural networks with Python and TensorFlow 2.0. Now, TensorFlow 2.0 is the brand new version of TensorFlow, still actually in the alpha stages right now, but it should be released within the next few weeks. But because it's an alpha, TensorFlow has been kind enough to release us that alpha version. So that's what we're gonna be working with in this tutorial series. And this will work for all future versions of TensorFlow 2.0, so don't be worried about that. Now, before I get too far into this first video, I just want to quickly give you an overview of exactly what I'm going to be doing throughout this series so you guys have an idea of what to expect and what you're going to learn. Now, the beginning videos, and especially this one, are going to be dedicated to understanding how a neural network works. And I think this is absolutely fundamental and that you have to have some kind of basis on the math behind a neural network before you're really able to actually properly implement one. Now, TensorFlow does a really nice job of making it super easy to implement neural networks and to use them, but to actually have a successful and complex neural network, you have to understand how they work on the lower level. So that's what we're going to be doing for the first few videos. After that, what we'll do is we'll start designing our own neural networks that can solve the very basic uh, MNIST data sets that TensorFlow provides to us. Now, these are pretty straightforward and pretty simple, but they give us a really good building block on understanding how the architecture of a neural network works, what are some of the different activation functions, how you can connect layers, and all of that, which will transition us nicely into creating our own neural networks using our own data for something like playing a game. Now, personally, I'm really interested with neural networks playing games, and I'm sure a lot of you are as well, and that's what I'm gonna be aiming to do near the end of the series on kind of our larger project, be designing a neural network and tweaking it so that it can play a very basic game that I've personally designed in Python with Pygame. Now, with that being said, that's kind of it for what we're going to be doing in this series. I may continue this on future uh, in later videos and do like very specific neural network series, maybe a chatbot or something like that. But I need you guys to let me know uh, what you'd like to see in the comments down below. With that being said, if you're excited about the series, make sure you drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when I post the new videos. And with that being said, let's get into this first video on how a neural network works and what a neural network is. So let's start talking about what a neural network is and how they work. Now, when you hear neural network, you usually think of neurons. Now, neurons are what compose our brain, and I believe, don't quote me on this, we have billions of them in our body or in our brain. Now, the way that neurons work on a very simple and high level is you have a bunch of them that are connected in some kind of way. So let's say these are four neurons, and they're connected in some kind of pattern. Now, in this case, our pattern is completely like uh, like random. We're just arbitrary. We're just picking a connection, but this is the way that they're connected. OK, now neurons can either fire or not fire. So they need to be on or off, just like a one or a zero. OK, so let's say that for some reason this neuron decides to fire. Maybe you touch something, maybe you um, smelt something, something fires in your brain and this neuron decides to fire. Now it's connected to, in this case, all of the other neurons. So what it will do is it will look at its other neurons and the connection and it will possibly cause its connected neurons to fire or to not fire. So in this case, let's say maybe this one firing causes this connected neuron to fire, this one to fire, and maybe this one was already firing and now it's decided it turned it off or something like that, okay? So that's what happened. Now, when this neuron fires, well, it's connected to this neuron and it's connected to this neuron. Well, it's already got that connection, but let's say that maybe when this one fires, it causes this one to unfire because it was just fired, something like that, right? And then this one, now that it's off, it causes this one to fire back up and then it goes, and it's just a chain of firing and unfiring and th that's just kind of how it works, right? Firing and unfiring. Now that's as far as I'm gonna go into explaining neurons, but this kind of gives us a little bit of a basis for a neural network. Now a neural network essentially is a connected layer of neurons or connected layers, so multiple of neurons. So in this case, let's say that we have a first layer, we're gonna call this our input layer that has four neurons. And we have one more layer that only contains one neuron. Now, these neurons are connected. Now, in our neural network, we can have our connections happening in different ways. We can have each, uh, what do you call it, neuron connected to each other neuron, so from layer to layer, or we can have like some connected to others, some not connected, some connected multiple times. It really depends on the type of neural network we're doing. Now, in most cases, what we do is we have what's called a fully connected neural network, 
which means that each uh, neuron in one layer is connected to each neuron in the next layer exactly one time. So if I were to add another neuron here, then what would happen is each of these neurons would also connect to this neuron one time. So we would have a total of eight connections because four times two is eight, right? And that's how that would work. Now for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna use um, one neuron in the next layer just to make things a little bit easier to understand. Now all of these connections have what is known as a weight. Now this is in a neural network specifically, okay? So we're gonna say this is known as weight one, this is known as weight two, this is weight three, and this is weight four. And again, just to reemphasize, this is known as our input layer because it is the first layer in our connected layers of neurons, okay? And going with that, the last layer in our connected layer of neurons is known as our output layer. Now, these are the only two layers that we really concern ourselves with when we look and use a neural network. Now, obviously when we create them, we have to determine what layers we're gonna have and the connection type, but when we're actually using the neural network to make predictions or to train it, we are only concerning ourselves with the input layer and the output layer. Now, what does this do and how do these neural networks work? Well, essentially given some kind of input, we want to uh, do something with it and get some kind of output, right? In most instances, that's what you want. Input results in an output. In this case, we have four inputs and we have one output, but we could have a case where we have four inputs and we have 25 outputs, right? It really depends on the kind of problem we're trying to solve. So this is a very simple example, but what I'm going to do is show you how we would or how a neural network would work to train a very basic snake game. So let's uh, look at a very basic snake game. So let's say this is our snake, okay? And this is his head. Um, actually, yeah, let's say this is his head, but like this is what the position of the snake looks like where this is the tail, okay? We'll circle the tail. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna train a neural network that will allow this snake to stay alive. So essentially its output will be what direction to go in or like to follow a certain direction or not, okay? Essentially just keep this snake alive. That's what I want it to do. Now, how am I gonna do this? Well, the first step is to decide what our input is gonna be and then to decide what our output is gonna be. So in this case, I think a clever input is gonna be, do we have something in front of the snake? Do we have something to the left of the snake? And do we have something to the right of the snake? Because in this case, all that's here is just the snake and he just needs to be able to survive. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, is there something to the left? Yes, no, something in front, yes, no, so zero, one, something to the right, yes, no. And then our last input will be a recommended direction for the snake to go in. So the recommended direction could be anything. So in this case, maybe we'll say the recommended direction is left. And what our output will be is whether or not to follow that recommended direction or not, or to try to do a different uh, recommendation, essentially, or go to a different direction. So let's do one case on how we would expect this neural network to perform without train, like once it's trained, right, based on some given input. So let's say there's not, not something to the left. So we're gonna put a zero here because this one will represent if there's anything to the left. The next one will be uh, front. So we'll say, well, there's nothing in front. Uh, the next one will be to the right. So we'll say right, and we'll say, yes, there is something to the right of the snake. And our recommended direction can be anything we'd like. So in this case, we say the recommended direction is left. And the way we'll do the recommended direction is negative one, zero, one, where negative one is left, zero is in front, and one is to the right, okay? So we'll say in this case, our recommended direction is negative one, and we'll just denote this by direction. Now our output in this instance should either be a zero or a one, representing do we follow the recommended direction or do we not? So let's see, in this case, following the recommended direction would keep our snake alive. So we'll say one, yes, we will follow the recommended direction. That is acceptable, that is fine. We're gonna stay alive when we do that. Now, let's see what happens when we change the recommended direction to be right. So let's say that we say one as our recommended direction. Again, this is Dern here. Then what should our output be? Well, if we decide to go right, we are gonna crash into our tail which means that we should not follow that direction, so our output should be zero. So I hope you're understanding how we would expect this neural network to perform. All right, so now, how do we actually 
design this neural network? How do we get this to work? How do we train this, right? Well, that is a very good question, and that is what I'm going to talk about now. So let me actually just erase some of this stuff so we have a little bit more room to work with some math stuff right here. But right now, what we start by doing is we start by designing what's known as the architecture of our neural network. So we've already done this. We have the input and we have the output. Now, each of our inputs is connected to our outputs, and each of these connections has what's known as a weight. Now, another thing that we have is each of our input neurons has a value, right? We had, in this case, we either had zero or we had one. Now, these values can be different, right? These values can either be decimal values or they can be like between zero and 100. They don't have to be just between zero and one, but the point is that we have some kind of value, right? So what we're gonna do in this output layer to determine what way we should go is essentially we are going to take the weighted sum of the values multiplied by the weights. I'm going to talk about how this works more in depth in a second, but just, just follow me now. So what this symbol means is take the sum. Uh, and what we do is I'm going to say in this case, I, which is going to be our variable. And I'll talk about how this kind of thing works in a second. We'll say I equals one. And I'm going to say, we'll take the weighted sum of, in this case, value I multiplied by weight I. So what this means essentially is we're going to start at um, i equals one. We're going to use i as our variable for looping. And we're going to say, in this case, we're going to do v1 times vi, or sorry, vi times wi, and then we're going to add all of those. So what this will return to us actually will be v1, w1 plus v2, w2 plus v3, w3 plus v4, w4. And this will be, uh, our output. That's that's what our output layer is going to have as a value. Now, this doesn't really make um, much sense right now, right? Like, why why are we doing this weights? What what is this multiplication? We'll just follow with me for one second. So, this is what our output layer is going to do. Now, there's one thing that we have to add to this as well, and this is what is known as our uh, biases. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take this weighted sum, but we're also going to have some kind of bias on each of these weights. Okay. And what this bias is known as, it's denoted by C typically, um, but essentially it is some value that we just automatically add or subtract. It's a constant value for each of these weights. So, we're going to say all of these these connections have a weight, but they also have a bias. So we're going to have B1, B2, B3, and B4. Uh, I, well, we'll call it B instead of C. So what I'll do here is what I'm also going to do is I'm also going to add these biases in when I do these weights. So we're going to say B, I as well. So now what we'll have is we'll have at the end here plus B, I, or plus B1, plus B2, plus B3, plus B4. Now, again, I know you guys are like, what the heck am I doing? This, this makes no sense. It's about to make sense in one second. So now what we need to do is we need to train the network. So we've understood now this is essentially what this output layer is doing. We're taking all of these um, weights and these values, we're multiplying them together and we're adding them and we're taking what's known as the weighted sum. Okay. But how do we like, what are these values? How do we get these values? And how is this going to give us a valid output? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to train the network on a ton of different information. So let's say we play 1000 games of snake and we get all of the different inputs and all the different outputs. So what we'll do is we'll randomly decide like a recommended direction and we'll just take the state of the snake, which will be either is there something to the left to the right uh, or in front of it. And then we'll take the output, which will be um, like, did the snake survive or did the snake not survive? So. We'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll we'll train the network using that information. So we'll generate all of this different information and then train the network. And what the network will do is it will look at all of this information and it will start adjusting these biases and these weights to properly get a correct output. Because what we'll do is we'll give it all this input, right? So let's say we give it the input again of zero, one, zero, and maybe one, like this is a random input. And let's say the output for this case is, um, what do you call it? So one is go to the right. The output is one, which is correct. Well, what the network will do is say, okay, I got that correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to bother adjusting the network because uh, this is fine. So I don't have to change any of these biases. I don't have to change any of these weights. Everything is working fine. But let's say that we get the answer wrong. So maybe the output was zero, but the answer should have been one because we know the answer, obviously, because we've generated all the input and the output. So now what the network will do is it will start adjusting these weights and adjusting these biases. 
it'll say, all right, so I got this one wrong and I've gotten like five or six wrong before. And this is what was familiar when I got something wrong. So let's add one to this bias or let's multiply this weight by two. And what it will do is it'll start adjusting these weights and these biases so that it gets more things correct. So obviously that's why neural networks typically take a massive amount of information to train because what you do is you pass it all of this information and then it keeps going through the network and at the beginning it sucks, right? Because it has this network just starts with random weights and random biases. But as it goes through and it learns, it says, okay, well, I got this one correct. So let's leave the weights and the biases the same, but let's remember that this is what the weight and the bias was when this was correct. And then maybe you get something wrong and it says, okay, so let's adjust bias one a little bit. Let's adjust weight one. Uh, let's mess with these and then let's try another example. And then it says, okay, I got this example right. Maybe we're moving in the right direction. Maybe we'll adjust another weight. Maybe we'll adjust another bias. And eventually your goal is that you get to a point where your network is very accurate because you've given it a ton of data and it's adjusted the weights and the biases correctly so that this kind of formula here of this weighted average will just always give you the correct answer or has a very high accuracy or high chance of giving you the correct answer. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I'm definitely oversimplifying things in how the adjustment of these weights and these biases work, but it's not crazy important. And we're not going to be doing any of the adjustment ourselves. We're, we are just going to be kind of tweaking a few things with the network. So as long as you understand that when you feed information, what happens is it checks whether the network got it correct or got it incorrect, and then it adjusts the network accordingly. And that is how the learning process works for a neural network. All right, so now it's time to discuss a little bit about activation functions. So right now, what I've actually just described to you is a very advanced technique of linear regression. So essentially, I was saying we are adjusting weights, we're adjusting biases, and essentially we are creating a function that given the inputs of like X, Y, Z, W, or like left, front, right, we are giving some kind of output. But all we've been doing to do that essentially is just adjusting a linear function because our degree is only one, right? We have weights of degree one multiplying by values of degree one, and we're adding some kind of bias. And that kind of reminds you of the form MX plus B. We're literally just adding a bunch of MX plus Bs together, which gives us like a fairly complex linear function. But this is really not a great way to do things because it limits the degree of complexity that our network can actually have to be linear. And that's not what we want. So now we have to talk about activation functions. So if you understand everything that I've talked about so far, you're doing amazing. Th this is great. You understand that essentially the way that the network works is you feed information in and it adjusts these weights and biases. There's a specific way it does that, which we'll talk about later. And then you get some kind of output. And based on that output, you're trying to adjust the weights and biases and, and all that, right? So now what we need to do is talk about activation functions. And what an activation function does is it's essentially a non-linear function that will allow you to add a degree of complexity to your network so that you can have more of a function that's like this, as opposed to a function that is a straight line. So an example of an activation function is something like a sigmoid function. Now a sigmoid function, what it does is It'll map any value you give it in between the value of negative one and one. So for example, when we create this network, our output might be like the number seven. Now this number seven, well, it is closer to one than it is to zero. So we might deem that a correct answer, or we might say that this is actually way off because it's way above one, right? But what we want to do essentially is in our output layer, we only want our values to be within a certain range. We want them to be in this case between zero and one, or maybe we want them to be between negative one and one, um, saying like how close we are to zero, making that decision, how close we are to one, something like that, right? So what this sigmoid activation function does, it's a nonlinear function and it takes any value and essentially the closer that value is to infinity, the closer um, the output is to one. And the closer that value is to negative infinity, the closer that output is to negative one. So what it does is it adds a degree of complexity to our network. Now, if you don't, if you're not a high level like math student, or you only know like very basic high school math, this might not really make sense to you, but essentially the degree of something, right, is honestly how complex it can get. If you have like a degree nine function, then what you could do is you can have some crazy kind of curve 
uh, and stuff going on, especially in multiple dimensions, that will just make things like much more complex. So for example, if you have like a degree nine function, you can have curves that are going like, like this, uh, like all around here that are mapping your different values. And if you only have a linear function, well, you can only have a straight line, which limits your degree of complexity by a significant amount. Now, what these activation functions also do is they shrink down your data so that it is not as large. So for example, right, like say we're working with data that is like hundreds of thousands of like characters long or digits, we'd want to shrink that into like normalize that data so that it's easier to actually work with. So let me give you a more practical example of how to use the activation function. I talked about what sigmoid does. What we would do is we would take this weighted sum. So we did the sum of W I V I um, plus B I, right? And we would apply an activation function to this. So we would say maybe our activation function is F of X and we would say F of this. And this gives us some value, which is now going to be our output neuron. And the reason we do that again is so that when we are adjusting our weights and biases and we add that activation function and now we can have a way more complex function as opposed to just having the kind of linear regression straight line, which is what we've I've talked about in my other machine learning courses. So if this is kind of going a little bit over your head, it may be my lack of explaining it. I'd love to hear in the comments below how you think of this explanation, but essentially that's what the activation function does. Now, another activation function that is very popular and is actually used way more than sigmoid nowadays is known as rectify linear unit. And what this does is it, let me draw it in red actually, so it, we can see it better is it takes all of the values that are negative and automatically puts them to zero and takes all of the values that are positive and just makes them more positive essentially, or like to some level positive, right? And what this again is going to do is it's a nonlinear function. So it's going to uh, enhance the complexity of our model and just make our data points in between the range zero and positive infinity, which is better than having between negative infinity and positive infinity for when we're calculating uh, error. All right. Last thing to talk about for neural networks in this video, I'm trying to kind of get everything like briefly into one long video is a, a loss function. So this is again going to help us understand how these weights and these biases are actually adjusted. So we know that they're adjusted and we know that what we do is we look at the output uh, and we compare it to what the output should be from our test data. And then we say, okay, let's adjust the weights and the biases accordingly. But how do we adjust that? And how do we know how far off we are, how much to tune by, if an adjustment even needs to be made? Well, we use what's known as a loss function. So a loss function essentially is a way of calculating error. Now there's a ton of different loss, loss functions. Some of them are like mean squared error. That's the name of one of them. I think one is like, um, oh, I can't even remember the name of this one, but there's, there's a bunch of very popular ones. If you know some, leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear all the different ones. Uh, but anyways, what the loss function will do is tell you how wrong your answer is because let, like, let's think about this, right? If you get an answer of, let's say maybe our output is like 0 0.79 and the actual answer was one. Well, that's pretty close. Like that's pretty close to one, but right now all we're going to get is the fact that we were 0 0.21 off. Okay. So 0 0.21 off. So adjust the weights a certain degree based on 0 0.21. But the thing is, what if we get like 0 0.85? Well, is this like, this is significantly better than 0 0.79, but this is only going to say that we were better by what is this 0 0.15. So we're still going to do a significant amount of adjusting to the weights and the biases. So what we need to do is we need to apply a loss function to this that will give us a better kind of degree of like how wrong or how right we were. Now these loss functions are again, um, not linear loss functions, which means that we're going to add a higher degree of complexity to our model, which will allow us to create way more complex models and neural networks that can solve better problems. I don't really want to talk about loss functions too much because I'm definitely no expert on how they work, but essentially what you do is you're comparing the output to the, what the output should be. So like whatever the model generated based on what it should be. And then you're going to get some value. And based on that value, you are going to adjust the biases and the weights accordingly. The reason we use the loss function again is because we want a higher degree of complexity. They're nonlinear. And you know, if you get zero, if you're 99%, like say you're 0.1 away from the correct answer, we probably want to adjust the weights very, very little. But if you're like 
way off the answer your two whole points maybe our answer is negative one and we want it to be one well we want to adjust the model like crazy right because that model was horribly wrong it wasn't even close so we would adjust it way more than just like two points of adjustment right we'd adjust it based on whatever that loss function gave to us so anyways this has kind of been my explanation of a neural network i want to very i want to state right here for everyone that i am no pro on neural networks this is my understanding there might be some stuff that's a little bit flawed or some areas that i skipped over and quickly actually because i know some people are probably going to say this when you're creating neural networks as well you have another thing that is called hidden layers so right now we've only been using two layers but in most neural networks what you have is a ton of different input neurons that connect to what's known as a hidden layer or multiple hidden layers of neurons so let's say we have like an architecture maybe that looks something like this so all these connections uh, and then these ones connect to this and what this allows you to do is have way more complex models that can solve way more difficult problems because you can generate different combinations of inputs and hidden what, what is known as hidden layer neurons um, to solve your problem and have more weights and more biases to adjust which means you can on average be more accurate um, to produce certain models so you can have crazy neural networks that look something like this but with way more neurons and way more layers and all this kind of stuff I just wanted to show a very basic network today because I didn't want to go in and talk about like a ton of stuff especially because I know a lot of people that watch my videos are not pro math guys are just trying to get a basic understanding and be able to implement some of this stuff Now in today's video, what we're going to be doing is actually getting our hands dirty and working with a bit of code and loading in our first data set. So we're not actually going to do anything with the model right now. We're going to do that in the next video. This video is going to be dedicated to understanding data, the importance of data, how we can scale that data, look at it and understand how that's going to affect our model when training. The most important part of machine learning, at least in my opinion, is the data. And it's also one of the hardest things to actually get done correctly. Training the model and testing the model and using it is actually very easy and you guys will see that as we go through But getting the right information to our model and having it in the correct form is something that is way more challenging than it may seem With these initial data sets that we're going to work with things are going to be very easy because the data sets are going to be given to us But when we move on into future videos to using our own data, we're going to have to pre-process it we're going to have to put it in its correct form. We're going to have to send it into an array. And we're going to have to make sure that the data makes sense. So we're not adding things that shouldn't be there or we're not omitting things that need to be there. So anyways, I'm just going to quickly say here that I am kind of working off of this TensorFlow 2.0 tutorial that is on uh, TensorFlow's website. Now, I'm kind of going to stray from it quite a bit to be honest but I'm just using the data sets that they have and a little bit of the code that they have here because it's a very nice introduction to machine learning and neural networks but there's a lot of stuff in here that they don't talk about and it's not very in-depth so that's what I'm kinda gonna be adding and the reason why maybe you'd wanna watch my version of this as opposed to just reading this off the website because if you have no experience with neural networks it is kind of confusing some of the stuff they do here and they don't really talk about why they use certain things or whatnot so anyways, the data set we're going to be working with today is it's known as the Fashion MNIST data set. So you may have heard of the old data set, which is image, uh, image classification, but it was like digits. So like you had digits from 0 to 9 and the neural network would classify digits. This one's a very similar principle, except we're going to be doing it with like t-shirts and pants and um, what do you call it, like sandals and all that. So these are kind of some examples of what the images look like, and we'll be showing them as well in, uh, in the code. So that's enough of that. I just felt like I should tell you guys that the first thing that we're going to be doing before we can actually start working with TensorFlow is we obviously need to install it. Now, actually, maybe I'll grab the install command here so I don't have to copy it. But this is the install command for TensorFlow 2.0. So I'm just going to copy it here. Link will be in the description as well as on my website. And you can see pink pip install hyphen Q TensorFlow equals equals 2.0.0 hyphen alpha zero. Now, I already have this installed, but I'm going to go ahead and hit enter anyways. And the hyphen Q, I believe, just means don't give any output when you're installing. So if this runs and you don't see any output whatsoever, then you have successfully installed TensorFlow 2.0. Now, I ran into an issue where I couldn't install it because I had a previous version of NumPy installed in my system. 
So if for some reason this doesn't work and there's something with NumPy, I would just pip uninstall NumPy and reinstall. So do pip uninstall NumPy like that. Uh, I'm obviously not going to run that. But if you did that and then you tried to reinstall TensorFlow 2.0, that should work for you and it should actually install its own version of the most updated version of NumPy. Now another thing we're going to install here is going to be matplotlib. Now matplotlib is a nice library for just graphing and showing images and different information that we'll use a lot through this series. So let's install that. I already have it installed, but go ahead and do that. And then finally, we will install pandas, which we may be using in later videos uh, in the series. So I figured we might as well install it now. So pip install pandas. And once you've done that, you should be ready to actually go here and start getting our data loaded in and looking at the data. So I'm just going to be working in subline text and uh, executing my Python files from the command line, just because this is something that will work for everyone, no matter what, but feel free to work in IDLE, feel free to work in PyCharm, as long as you understand how to set up your environment so that you have the necessary packages like TensorFlow and all of that, uh, then you should be good to go. So let's start by importing TensorFlow. So we'll import TensorFlow as TF like that. I don't know why it always short forms when I try to do this, but anyways, we're going to import, uh, or actually, sorry, from TensorFlow, we'll import Keras. Now, Keras is a, an API for TensorFlow, which essentially just allows us to write less code. Uh, it does a lot of stuff for us. Like you'll see when we set up the model, we use Keras and it'll be really nice and simple. And it's just like a high level API. And that's the way that they describe it. That makes things a lot easier for people like us that aren't going to be defining our own tensors and writing our own code from scratch, essentially. Now, another thing we need to import is NumPy. So we're going to say import, if I could get this here, import NumPy as NP. And finally, we will import uh, matplotlib. So matplotlib, in this case, dot pyplot, as PLT. And this again is just going to allow us to graph some things here. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're actually going to get our data set loaded in. So the way that we can load in our data set is using Keras. So to do this, I'm just going to say data equals in this case Keras dot data sets dot fashion underscore MNIST. Uh, and this is just the name of the data set. There's a bunch of other data sets inside of Keras that we will be using in the future. Now, whenever we have data, it's very important that we split our data into testing and training data. Now you may have heard this, um, you talk about this in the previous machine learning tutorials I did, but essentially what you want to do with any kind of machine learning algorithm, especially a neural network is you don't want to pass all of your data into the network. When you train it, you want to pass about 90, 80% of your data to the network to train it. And then you want to test the network for accuracy and making sure that it works properly on the rest of your data that it hasn't seen yet. Now, the reason you'd want to do this, uh, and a lot of people would say, well, why don't I just give all my data to the network and it'll make it better? Not necessarily. And that's because if you test your data on, if you test your network on data, it's already seen then you can't be sure that it's not just simply memorizing the data it's seen, right? For example, if you show me five images um, and then like you tell me the classes of all of them and then you show me that uh, the same image again and you say, what's the class and I get it right. Well, did I get it right because I figured out how to analyze the images properly or because I'd already seen it and I knew what it was, right? I just me memorized what it was. So that's something we want to try to avoid with our models. So whenever we have our data, we're going to split it up into testing and training data. And that's what we're going to do right here. So to do this, I'm going to say train, uh, in this case, train underscore images and train underscore labels, comma, in this case, test underscore images, comma, test underscore labels. And then we're going to say this is equal to data dot get underscore data. So not get data load underscore data. Now, the reason we can do this is just because this load data method is going to return information in a way where we can kind of split it up like this. In most cases, when you're writing your own models for your own data, you're going to have to write your own arrays and for loops and load in data and do all this uh, fancy stuff. But Keras makes it nice and easy for us just by allowing us to write this line here, which will get us our training and testing data in the for of kind of variables that we need. So quickly, let me talk about what labels are now. So for this specific data set, there are 10 labels. And that means each image that we have will have a specific label assigned to it. Now, if I I'll, actually I'll show you by just printing it out. If I print, for example, train underscore labels, and let's just print like the zero with uh, I guess the first training label. So let me just run this file. So Python 
tutorial one, you can see that we simply get the number nine. Now, this is just what is represent like the label representation. So obviously it's not giving us a string, but let's say if I pick, for example, six uh, and I hit enter here, you can see that the label is seven. So the labels are between zero and nine. Uh, so 10 labels in total. Now, the thing is, that's not very useful to us because we don't really know what label zero is, what label nine is. So what I'm going to do is create a list that will actually define what those labels are. So I'm going to have to copy it from here because I actually don't remember the labels. Uh, but you can see it says here what they are. So, for example, label zero is a T-shirt. Label one is a trouser. Nine is an ankle boot. And you can see what they all are. So we just need to define exactly this list here. So class names so that we can simply take whatever value is returned to us from the model of what label it thinks it is. And then just throw that as an index to this list so we can get what label it is. All right. Sweet. So that is... Um, how we're getting the data now. So now I want to show you what some of these images look like and talk about the architecture of the neural network we might use uh, in the next video. So I'm going to use PyPlot just to show you some of these images uh, and explain kind of the input and the output and all of that. So if, if you want to show an image using matplotlib, you can do this by just doing plt.im show and then in here simply putting the image. So for example, if I do train not labels images, and let's say we do the seventh image and then I do plt.show. If I run this now, you guys will see what this image is. So let's run this and you can see that we get uh, this is actually, I believe, like a pullover or a hoodie. Now, I know it looks weird and you've got all this like green and purple. That's just because of the way that kind of matplotlib shows these images. If you want to see it properly, what you do is I believe you do cmap equals in this case, uh, plt dot c, I think it's like cm dot binary or something. Uh, I gotta have a look here because I forget. Uh, yeah, cm dot binary. So if we do this and now we decide to display the image, it should look a little bit better. Let's see here. Uh, and there you go. We can see now we're actually getting this like black and white kind of image. Now, this is great and all, but let me show you actually what our image looks like. So like, how was I just able to show, like, how was I just able to do this image? Well, the reason I'm able to do that is because all of our images are actually arrays of 28 by 28 pixels. So let me print one out for you here. So if I do train underscore images, let's do seven, the same example here and print that to the screen. I'll show you what the data actually looks like. Uh, give it a second. And there we go. So you can see this is obviously what our data looks like. And it's just a bunch of lists so one list for each row and it just has pixel values and these pixel values are simply representative of I believe like how much I don't actually know the scale that they're on but uh, I think it's like an RGB value but in grayscale right so for example we have like 0 to 255 where 255 is black and 0 is white and I'm pretty sure that's how we're getting the information in someone can correct me if I'm wrong but I'm almost certain that that's how this actually works so this is great and all, but this is, these are large numbers. And remember I was saying before in the previous video, that's typically a good idea to shrink our data down so that it's with, within a certain range that is a bit smaller. So in this case, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to modify this information a little bit so that we only have each value out of one. So we, instead of having it out of 255, we have it out of one. So the way to do that is to divide every single pixel value by 255. Now, because these train images are actually stored in what's known as a NumPy array, we can simply just divide it by 255 to uh, achieve that. So we'll say train images equals train images divided by 255. And we'll do the same thing here with our test images as well. Now, obviously, we don't have to modify the labels as well. Also, because they're just between zero and nine, and that's how the labels work. But for our images, we're going to divide those values so that it's a bit nicer. So now let me show you what it looks like. So if I go Python tutorial one dot pi. And now you can see that we're getting these decimal values and that our shirt looks well the same, but exactly like we've just shrunk down our data. So it's going to be easier to work with in the future with our model. Now that's about it. I think that I'm going to show you guys in terms of this data. Now we have our data loaded in and we're pretty much ready to go in terms of making a model. 
Now, if you have any questions about the data, please don't hesitate to leave a comment down below. But essentially, again, the way it works is we're going to have 28 by 28 pixel images, and they're going to come in as an array, just as I've showed you here. So these are all the values that we're going to have. We're going to pass that to our model, and then our model is going to spit out what class it thinks it is. And those classes are going to be between zero and nine. Obviously, zero is going to represent t-shirt where nine is going to represent ankle boot. And we will deal with that all in the next video. Now in today's video, we're actually going to be working with the neural network. So we're going to be setting up a model. We're going to be training that model and we're going to be testing that model to see how well it performed. We will also use it to predict on individual images and all of that fun stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, the first thing that I want to do before we really get into actually writing any code is talk about the architecture of the neural network we're going to create. Now, I always found in tutorials that I watched, they never really explained exactly what the layers were doing, what they looked like and why we chose such layers. And that's what I'm hoping to give to you guys right now. So if you remember before, we know now that our images, they come in essentially as like 28 by 28 pixels. And the way that we have them is we have an array and we have another array inside. It's so like a two dimensional array and it has pixel values. So maybe it's like 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.3, which is the grayscale value. And this goes and there's times 28 in each row of these, um, these pixels. Now there's 28 rows, obviously, because well, 28 by 28 pixels. So in here again, we have the same thing, more pixel values, and we go down 28 times, right? And that's what we have. And that's what our array looks like. Now that's what our input data is. That's fine. But this isn't really going to work well for our neural network. What are we going to do? We're going to have one neuron, and we're just going to pass this whole thing to it. I don't think so. That's not going to work very well. So what we need to actually do before we can even like start talking about the neural network is figure out a way that we can change this information into a way that we can give it to the neural network. So what I'm actually going to do and what I mean most people do is they they do what's called flatten the data. So actually maybe we'll go uh, I can't even go back once I clear it. But flattening the data essentially is taking any like interior list. So let's say we have like lists like this and just like squishing them all together. So rather than, so let's say this is like one, two, three, if we were to flatten this, what we would do is, well, we would remove all of these interior arrays or lists or whatever it is. So we would just end up getting data that looks like one, two, three. And this actually turns out to work just fine for us. So in this instance, we only had like one element in each array, but when we're dealing with 28 elements in each, sorry, list, list and array, they're interchangeable, just in case I keep saying those. Uh, what we'll essentially have is we'll flatten the data so we get a list of length 784. And I believe that is because, well, I mean, I know this is because 28 times 28 equals 784. So when we flatten that data, so 28 rows of 28 pixels, then we end up getting 784 pixels just one after each other. And that's what we're going to feed in as the input to our neural network. So that means that our initial input layer is going to look something like this. We're going to have a bunch of neurons and they're going to go all the way down. So we're going to have 784 neurons. So let's say this is 784. I know you could probably hardly read that, but you get the point. And this is our input layer. Now, before we even talk about any kind of hidden layers, let's talk about our output layer. So what is our output? Well, our output is going to be a number between zero and nine. Ideally, that's what we want. So what we're actually going to do for our output layer is rather than just having one neuron that we used kind of in the last uh, the two videos ago as an example, is we're actually going to have 10 neurons, each one representing one of these different classes, right? So we have zero to nine. So obviously 10 neurons or 10 classes. So let's have 10 neurons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, what's going to happen with these neurons is each one of them is going to have a value and that value is going to represent how much the network thinks that it is each neuron. So, for example, say we're classifying the image um, that looks like a T-shirt uh, or maybe like a pair of pants. So those are pretty easy to draw. So let's say this is the image we're given a little pair of pants. What's going to happen is let's say pants is like this one, like this is the one it actually should be. All of these will be lit up a certain amount. So essentially, maybe we'll say like we think it's 0.05% this. We have like a degree of certainty that it's 10% this one. And then it is like we think it's 75% pants. 
So what we'll do when we are looking at this output layer is essentially we'll just find whatever one is the greatest. So whatever probability is the greatest and then say that's the one that the network predicts is uh, the class of the given object, right? So when we're training the network, what we'll do essentially is we'll say, okay, well, we're giving the pants. So we know that this one should be one, right? This should be a hundred percent. It should be one. Uh, that's what it should be. And all these other ones should be zero, right? Because it should be a 0% chance. It's anything else. Cause we know that it is pants. And then the network will look at all this and adjust all the weights and biases accordingly so that we get it so that it lights this one up directly as one, at least that's our goal, right? So uh, once we do that, so now we've talked about the input layer and the output layer. Now it's time to talk about our hidden layers. So we could technically train a network that would just be two layers, right? And we just have all these inputs that go to some kind of outputs, but that wouldn't really do much for us because essentially that would just mean we're just going to look at all the pixels and based on that configuration of pixels, will point to, you know, these output layers. And that means we're only going to have, which I know it sounds only 784 times 10 weights and biases. So 784 times 10, which means that we're only going to have 7,840 uh, weights, right? Weights and biases, things to adjust. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to add a hidden layer inside of here. Now you can kind of arbitrarily, arbitrarily pick how many neurons you're going to have in your hidden layer. It's a good idea to kind of go off based on percentages from your input layer. But what we're going to have is we're going to have a hidden layer. And in this case, this hidden layer is going to have 128 neurons. So we'll say this is 128 and this is known as our hidden layer. So what will happen now is we're going to have our inputs connecting to the hidden layer. So fully connected. And then the hidden layer will be connected to all of our output neurons, which will allow for much more complexity of our network because we're going to have a ton more biases and a ton more weights connecting to this middle layer, which maybe we'll be able to figure out some patterns. Like maybe it'll look for like a, st a straight line that looks like a pant sleeve or looks like an arm sleeve. Maybe it'll look for concentration of a certain area in the picture, right? And that's what we're hoping that our hidden layer will maybe be able to do for us. Maybe pick on pick up on some kind of patterns and then maybe with these combination of patterns, we can pick out what specific image it actually is. Now, we don't really know what the hidden uh, network or hidden layer is going to do. We just kind of have some hopes for it. And by picking 128 neurons, we're saying, OK, we're going to allow this hidden layer to kind of figure its own way out and figure out some way of analyzing this image. And then that's essentially what we're going to do. So if you have any questions about that, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, but the hidden layers are pretty arbitrary. Sorry, I just dropped my pen, which means that, you know, you can kind of experiment with them, kind of tweak with them. There's some that are known to be to do well, but typically when you're picking a hidden layer, you pick one and you typically go at like maybe 15, 20 percent of the input size. But again, it really depends on the application that you're you're using. So let's now actually just start um, working with our data and creating a model. So if we want to create a model, the first thing we, that we need to do is define the architecture or the layers for our model. And that's what we've just done. So I'm going to type it out fairly quickly here. And again, you guys will see how this works. So I'm going to say model equals in this case, Keras dot sequential, I believe that's how you spell it. And then what we're going to do is inside of here, put a list and we're going to start defining our different layers. So we're going to say Keras dot layers. And our first layer is going to be an input layer but it's going to be a flattened input layer and the input underscore shape is going to be equal to 28 by 28. So remember I talked about that initially what we need to do is well, we need to flatten our data so that it is uh, passable to all of those different neurons, right? So essentially, Oh, I got to spell shape correctly, shape correctly. So essentially whenever you're passing in information that's in like a 2d or 3d array, you need to flatten that information so that you're going to be able to pass it to an individual neuron as opposed to like, sending a whole list into one neuron, right? Now, the next layer that we're going to have is going to be what's known as a dense layer. Now, a dense layer essentially just means a fully connected layer, which means that what we've showed so far, which is only fully connected neural networks, uh, that's what we're going to have. So each node or each neuron is connected to every other neuron in the next network. So we're going to say layers dot dense. And in this case, we're going to give it 128 neurons. That's what we've talked about. And we're going to set the activation function, which we've talked about before as well, to be rectify linear unit. 
Now again, uh, this activation function is somewhat arbitrary in the fact that you can pick different ones, but rectifier linear unit is a very fast activation function and it works well for a variety of applications and that is why we are picking that. Now the next layer is going to be another dense layer, which means essentially another fully connected uh, layer, sorry, and we're going to have 10 neurons. This is going to be our output layer and we're going to have an activation of softmax. Now what softmax does is exactly what I explained uh, when showing you that kind of architecture picture. It will uh, pick values for each neuron so that all of those values add up to one. So essentially it is like the probability of the network uh, thinking it's a certain value. So it's like, I believe that it's 80% this, 2% uh, this, 5% this, but all of the neurons there, those values will add up to one. And that's what the softmax, fu softmax function does. So that actually means that we can look at the last layer and we can see the uh, probability or what the network thinks for each given class and say maybe those are two classes that are like 45% each, we can maybe tweak the output of the network to say like, I am not sure rather than predicting a specific uh, value, right? All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to just set up some uh, parameters for our model. So we're going to say model.compile. And in this case, we're going to use an optimizer of Atom. Now, I'm not really going to talk about the optimizer. Uh, Atom is typically like pretty standard, especially for something like this. We're going to use the loss function of sparse. And in this case, underscore categorical, I uh, believe I spelled that correctly. And then cross entropy. Now, if you're interested in what these do and how they work in terms of like the math kind of side of them, just look them up. There's they're very famous and popular and they're, they're again are somewhat arbitrary in terms of how you pick them. Now, when I do metrics, I'm going to say metrics equals accuracy. And again, this is just going to define what uh, we're looking at when we're testing the model. In this case, we care about the accuracy or how low we can get this loss function to be. So, yeah, you guys can look these up. There's tons of different loss functions. Some of them have different applications. And typically when you're making a neural network, you're, you'll mess around with different loss functions, different optimizers, and in some cases, different metrics. So now it is actually time to train our model. So to train our model, what we're going to do is model.fit. And when we fit it, all we're going to do is give it our train images and our train labels. Now we're going to set the amount of epochs. So now it's time to talk about epochs. Now epochs are actually fairly straightforward. You've probably heard of the word epoch before, but essentially it means how many times the model is going to see this information. So what an epoch is going to do is it's going to kind of randomly pick um, images and labels, obviously corresponding to each other, and it's going to feed that through the neural network. So how many epochs you decide is how many times you're going to see the same image. So the reason we do this is because the order in which images come in will influence how parameters and things are tweaked with the network. Maybe seeing like 10 images that are pants is going to tweak it differently than if it sees like a few that are pants and a few that are um, a shirt and some that are sandals. So this is a very simple explanation of how the epochs work, but essentially it just is giving um, the same images in a different order. And then maybe if it got one image wrong, it's going to see it again and be able to tweak. And it's just a way to increase hopefully the accuracy of our model. That being said, giving more epochs does not always necessarily increase the accuracy of your model. It's something that you kind of have to play with. And anyone that does any machine learning or neural networks will tell you that they can't really like they don't know the exact number of epochs, they have to play with it and tweak it and see what gives them the best accuracy. So anyways, now it is time to actually, uh, well, we can run this, but let's first get some kind of output here. So I'm going to actually evaluate this model directly after we run it so that we can see how it works on our test data. So right now, what this is doing is actually just training the model on our training data, which means we're tweaking all the weights and biases. Um, we're applying all those activation functions and we're defining like a main function for the model. But if we actually want to see how this works, we can't uh, really just test it on the training images and labels for the same reason I talked about before. So we have to test it on the test images and the test labels and essentially see how many it gets correct. So the way we do this is we're going to say uh, test underscore loss test underscore AC, which stands for accuracy equals model dot evaluate. Is that how you spell it? Maybe. And then we're going to do test images, test underscore labels. And I believe that is the last parameter. Yes, it is. So now if we want to see the accuracy of our model, we can simply print out test underscore ACC. And we'll just say like 
tested ACC, just so we know, because there is going to be some other metrics that are going to be printing out to us when we run this. All right. So now that we've done that, let's actually run our file and see how this works. So this is it. This whole part here is all we actually need to do to create a neural network and do a model. Now, actually, let me just quickly say that this keras.sequential, what this does is it means a, like a sequence of layers. So you're just defining them in order where you say the first layer obviously is going to be your input layer. We're, we're flattening the data. Then we're adding two dense layers, which are fully connected to the input layer as well. And that's what our model looks like. And this is typically how you go about creating a neural network. All right, so let's run this now and see what we get. So this will take a second or two to run um, just because obviously there is, well, we have 60,000 images in this data set. So, you know, it's got to run through them. It's doing all the epochs and you can see that we're getting uh, metrics here on our accuracy and our loss. Now our test accuracy was 87%. So you can see that that's actually slightly lower than um, what do you call it? Like the accuracy here. Oh, it's the exact same. Oh, it, it actually auto tested on some data sets, but anyways, so essentially that is um, how this works. You can see that the first five epochs, which are these ones here, uh, ran and they increase typically with each epoch. Now, again, we could try like 10 epochs, 20 epochs and see what it does. But there is a point where the more epochs you do, the actual like the less reliable your model becomes. Uh, and you can see that our accuracy was started at 88.9 essentially. And that was on like, that's what it said our model accuracy was when we were training the model. But then once we actually tested it, which are these two lines here, uh, it was lower than the, the tested or like the trained accuracy, which shows you that you obviously have to be testing on different images because when we tested it here, it said, well, it was 89%, but then here we only got 87%, right? So let's do a quick uh, tweak here and just see what we get. Maybe if we add like 10 epochs, uh, I don't think this will take a crazy long amount of time. So we'll run this and see maybe if it makes a massive difference or if it starts leveling out or it starts going lower or whatnot. Uh, so let me let this run here for a second. And obviously you can see the tweak accuracy as we continue to go. I'm interested to see here if we're going to increase by much or if it's just kind of going to stay at the same level. All right. So we're hitting about 90% and let's see here. 91. Okay. So, uh, we got up to 91%, but you can see that it was kind of diminishing returns as soon as we ended up getting to about seven epochs, even, yeah, even like eight epochs after this, we only increased by a marginal amount and our accuracy on the testing data was slightly better. But again, for the amount of epochs, five extra epochs, it did not give us a five times better result, right? So it's something you got to play with and see. Now in today's video, what we're going to be doing is just simply using our model to actually predict information on specific images and see how you can actually use the model. I find a lot of tutorial series don't show you how to actually practically use the model, but what's the point of creating a model if you can't use it? Now quickly, before I get too far into the video, I would just like to show you guys something that I'm super excited to announce because I've been waiting for them to come for a long time and it is the official Tech with Tim mugs. So you guys can see them here. I just wanted to quickly show them to you guys. If you'd like to support the channel and get an awesome looking mug, I actually really like them. Then uh, you guys can purchase them just by, I believe underneath the video, it shows like the Teespring link. Um, but yeah, they're awesome. They look really good. And the reason I've been holding out on showing them to you guys is because I wanted to wait till I received mine uh, to make sure that it was up to quality and that it looked good enough uh, to sell to you guys essentially. So if you'd like to support the channel, um, you can get one of those. If not, that's fine. But if you do decide to buy one, please send me like a DM on Twitter, Instagram or something and let me know so I can say thank you to you guys. So anyways, let's get into the video. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to, uh, we need to continually train the model every time we run the program, which I know seems like a pain, but unless we want to save the model, which I guess I could actually show in this video later as well. Uh, we just have to train it and then we can use it directly after. So after we've, you know, tested this, we don't even need to do this evaluate anymore. We are trained the model. We can use it to use it. We actually just need to use a method called predict, but I'm going to talk about kind of how this works because it is a little finicky or not even just finicky, but just not intuitive. So essentially when you want to make a prediction using the model, I'm going to set up a, uh, just a variable prediction here. You simply use model dot predict, and then you pass it a list. Now what you would think you would do is just pass it like the input, right? So in this case, we just pass it some input that's in the form 2828 and it would predict, but that's not actually how it works. 
when you want to make a prediction, what you need to do is put whatever your input shape is inside of a list or actually, well, you can do it inside of a list, but you can also do it inside uh, an MP array as well, like a NumPy array. And the reason you need to do that is because what predict does is it gives you a group of predictions. So it's expecting you to pass in a bunch of different things and it predicts all of them using the model. So for example, if I want to do the predictions on all of my test images to see what they are, I can do prediction equals model dot predict test images. And if I print out like prediction, uh, you guys will see what this looks like. So let's run this here uh, and see what we get. So obviously we have to train the model each time, which is a little bit annoying, but we can save it later on. And obviously this one runs pretty quickly, so it's not a huge deal. All right, so there we go. So now you can see this is actually what our predictions look like. Now, this is a really weird kind of like looking prediction thing, eh? We're getting a bunch of different lists. Now that's because, right, our output layer is 10 neurons. So we're actually getting an output of 10 different values. And these different values are representing how much the model thinks that each picture is a certain class, right? So you can see we're getting like 2.6 to the E to the negative 06, which means that obviously a very small number. So it doesn't think whatsoever that it's that. And then I'm trying to find if we can see ones that aren't like to the E, uh, but apparently it's, we didn't really get lucky enough with it showing because it just cut some of them off here. But if I print out, let's say like prediction uh, zero, and I guess we're going to have to run this again. I probably should have thought of that. <laughs> then you guys will see exactly what the prediction list looks like. And I'm going to show you how we can actually interpret this to determine what class it is, because this means nothing to us. We want to know, is it a sandal? Is it a shoe? Is it a shirt? Like, what is it? Right. So there you go. So this is what the list looks like. So if we look through the list here, we can see these are all the different probabilities that our uh, our network is predicting. So what we're actually going to do essentially is we're going to take whatever the highest number is there and we're going to say that is the predicted value. So to do that, what we do is we say NP dot arg max. OK, and we just put it around this list. Now, what this does is it just gets the largest value and finds like the index of that. So in this case, since we have 10 neurons, the first one is representing obviously t-shirt. The last one is representing ankle boot. It'll find whatever neuron is the largest value and give us the index of that neuron. So if it's like the third neuron, then it's going to give us a pullover, right? And, and that's how that works. So if we want to see the actual like name though, rather than just the index, then what we need to do is just take this value and pass it into class names. So we'll say class underscore names, and then we'll index whatever the value is that this np.argmax prediction zero gives us, right? So let's run this and see what we get now. All right, so there we go. So we can see that now we're actually getting ankle boot as our prediction, which makes a lot more sense for us, right? Rather than just giving us like that prediction array or whatever it was. Okay, so that's great. But the thing is, how do we, how can we validate this is actually working? Well, what we need to do now, or not what we need to do, but what we should do now is show the input and then show what the predicted value is. And that way we as the humans, which know obviously which is which can validate that. So what I'm going to do actually is just set up a very basic for loop. And what this for loop is going to do is loop through a few different images in our test images and show them on the screen and then also show the prediction. Uh, so show what they actually are and then show the prediction as well. So to do this, I'm just going to say for, I guess in this case, I in range five, and what we'll do is I'm going to say plt dot grid. I'm just going to set up a very basic like plot to show the image. I'm going to image show our test underscore images. I right. And I'm going to do the cmap thing. So I'm going to say cmap equals in this case plt dot cm dot binary, which is just going to give us like the grayscale. And then I'm going to say plt dot x label, which just means underneath. And I'm going to say is equal to actual. And in this case, I'm going to say a plus. And what do we want to do? We need to get the actual label of our test image, which would be in test underscore labels I. And then what I'm going to do is add a header and say this is what the model predicted. So to do this, I'm going to say plt dot. I believe it's oh, sorry, not header so dot title. And the title will simply be uh, prediction. Plus, in this case, we're going to say prediction <laughs> and then I. Now, the reason we can do this or sorry, we're going to have to literally copy this, this whole argmax thing, and we'll put that here 
except instead of zero, we're going to put I and just that way it will show uh, all of the different images, right? So now what I'm going to do is for each loop here, I'm going to plt dot show, which means I'm going to show those images so we can see exactly what they look like. So quick recap in case I kind of skimmed over some stuff. All we're doing is setting up a way to see the image as well as what it actually is versus what the model predicted. So we as the humans can kind of validate this is actually working and we see, OK, this is what the image and the input is. And this is what the output was from the model. So let's run this and wait for it to train. I'll fast forward through this and then we will show all the images. OK, so quick fix here. Um, <laughs> I just ran this and I got an error. We need to do class names and then test labels I. And that's obviously because the test labels are going to have like the index of all of these. So I can't just put like the number value. I have to put the class names so that we get the correct thing. Anyways, I hope that makes sense to you guys. <laughs> Let's run this now. You can see that was the error I ran into again. Fast forward and then I will be back. All right, so I am back now. This is a little bit butchered in how I'm actually showing it, but you can see that it's saying the prediction for this was the ankle boot and it actually is an ankle boot. Now, if I close this, it'll just show uh, four more because that's the way I've set it up. So now you can see that prediction pullover. It actually was a pullover. All right, uh, we see we get prediction trouser. It actually was a trouser and prediction trouser, actual trouser uh, prediction shirt, actual shirt. And obviously, if you wanted to see more, you could keep looping through all of these and doing that. Now, say you just want to predict on one image. Well, what you could do, for example, is uh, and this is kind of a weird way what I'm about to do, but you'll see. Let's say we wanted to just predict like what the seventh image was. Well, then what I would do is just say test images seven, which is going to give us that 28 by 28 array. And then I would just put it inside of a list so that that way uh, it gets it's given the way that it's supposed to look. But that also means that our prediction list, right, we're going to get uh, is equal to this. It's going to look like prediction and then it's going to have this. And then inside, it's going to have all those different values. So it's going to have like 0 0.001, 0 0.9, but it's going to be a list inside of a list. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with these predictions, because that is really the only way to do it. And that this is exactly what TensorFlow recommends on their website as well. If you're just predicting for one item, just put it inside of a list so that it's going to work fine. So anyways, that has kind of been it on using the model to predict stuff in future videos. We'll get into a little bit more advanced stuff. This was a very easy classification problem, just really meant to give you an introduction. And personally, I think if you never worked with any machine learning stuff, this is pretty cool that in a few minutes of just kind of writing a little bit of code, whether you understand it or not, you can create a simple model that can classify fashion items like a shirt, a t-shirt. And I don't know, that's pretty cool to me. And in future videos, obviously, we're going to be doing a lot cooler stuff. It's going to be a little bit more advanced, but hopefully you guys can stick with it. I'd love to know what you guys think of this series so far. So please leave a comment down below. Uh, it helps me to kind of tweak my lessons and all that as we go forward. If you guys enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe. And I will see you again in. Now, in today's video, what we're going to be doing is talking about text classification uh, with TensorFlow 2.0. Now, what I'm going to be doing just to be full, tr fully transparent with you guys here is following along with the actual official tutorials on the TensorFlow 2.0 tutorial. Uh, now, I find that these are actually the best in terms of like kind of a structure to start with to understand very basic neural networks for some pretty simple tasks, I would say. And then we're going to stray away from those. We're going to start using our own data, our own networks, our own architecture. And we'll start talking about kind of some of the issues you have when you actually start applying these to real data. So, so far, you guys have noticed and I've seen some comments on it already that the data is really easy to load in. And even pre-processing it, like in the last one, we just divided everything by 255. Like that's really simple. In the real world, your data is definitely not that nice. And there's a lot of stuff that you need to play with and modify to make it actually usable. So anyways, we'll follow along with this one for today. And essentially the way that it works is we're going to have movie reviews and we're just going to classify them either as either positive or negative. Now, what we'll do is we'll just look at some of the movie reviews and then we'll talk about the data. We'll talk about the architecture, using stuff to predict some issues you might run into and all of that. Now, I don't know how many video parts this is going to be. I'm going to try to record it all at once and just split it up based on how long it takes. But with that being said, enough talking. Let's get started. 
So what we're going to do obviously is start in our file here. And again, this is going to be really nice because we can just steal kind of the data from Keras. So what we'll start by doing is just importing TensorFlow as TF. We're going to say from TensorFlow import Keras. And then we're going to say import NumPy as NP. Now, before I start, I ran into a quick uh, issue when I was actually trying to do this, just following along with the official tutorial. And that was that the data that I want to grab here actually doesn't work with the current version of NumPy that comes with TensorFlow. It's on their GitHub as an issue. But anyways, to fix this, what we need to do is install the previous version of NumPy. So to do this, uh, what I'm actually going to do is just say pip. Um, I think I can do like pip NumPy version or something because I want to see what version it is. Uh, in incorrect command. Let's say pip version numpy. I want to find what version it is and then just go down uh, to that version. Okay, so I found the version of numpy. Uh, what we're going to do now is actually just install the correct version of numpy to make it work for this tutorial. Now, this should be fine for everything going forward. And if you want to install the most recent version of numpy after doing this, go feel free. But to do this, all I'm going to do is just say pip install and then numpy equals in this case. 1.16.1. I believe the version we're using right now is 0.3, at least at the time of recording this, but just change it to this version. And hopefully in the future, they'll fix that issue so that we don't have to do this. But anyways, I'm going to install that. Um, yeah, you're going to have to add two equal signs. And I already have this installed. So that should just not do anything. But you guys just make sure you do that. I'll leave the command in the description. Now, after we do that, what I'm going to do is just load in the data. I'm going to say data equals in this case, Keras dot data sets dot I am what is it I am DB now I believe this stands for like some something movie database I don't really know but anyways that's what the database is and we're gonna do the same thing we did in the previous tutorial which is just split this into training and testing data so to do that I'm gonna say train underscore data uh, train underscore labels comma and then in this case we'll say test underscore data and then test underscore labels equals in this case data dot load underscore data. Now we're just going to add one thing in here, which is num underscore words equals in this case 10,000. Now the reason I'm doing this is because this data set contains like a ton of different words. And what we're going to actually do by saying num words equals 10,000 is only take the words that are the 10,000 most frequent, which means we're going to leave out words that usually are only occurring like once or twice throughout the entire data set, because we don't want to throw those into our model and have things like be more difficult than they have to be and just have data that's kind of irrelevant because if we're going to be comparing obviously uh, movie reviews and there's some words that are only in like one review, we should probably just omit them because there's nothing to really compare them to in other data sets anyways. I hope that kind of makes sense, but that's not super important. We're just going to do num words equals uh, 10,000. It also shrinks our data a little bit, which makes it a bit nicer. Now, what we're going to do next is we're actually going to show how we can display this data. Now, if I start by actually just showing you like the train underscore data and let's pick like the zero with one. So I guess the first one and I print this out to the screen. So I'll just go uh, if I could get to Path Python. And I guess in this case, we'll have to do I probably should just type this to start uh, tutorial two. Uh, when this actually prints out, probably going to take a second here just to download the data set. You can see that what we have is actually just a bunch of numbers. Now, this doesn't really look like a movie review to me, does it? Well, what this actually is, is integer encoded uh, words. So essentially, each of these integers point to a certain word. And what we've done just to make it way easier for our model to actually classify these and work with these is we've given each word one integer. So in this case, maybe like the word, the integer one stands for something, the integer 14 stands for something. And all we've done is just added those integers into a list that represents where these words are located in the movie review. Now, this is nice for the computer, but it's not very nice for us if we actually want to read these words. So what we have to do is find the mappings for these words and then find some way to actually display this so that, you know, we can have a look at it. Now, I'll be honest here. I'm just going to take this from what they have on the TensorFlow website on how to do this. Typically, you would create your own mappings for words with your own dictionary and you just already have that information. But fortunately for us, TensorFlow already does that. So to do that, I'm going to say word underscore index equals in this case, I am DB dot get underscore word underscore index like this. Now what this does is actually going to give us a dictionary that has those keys and those mappings so that what we can do is well figure out, you know, what these integers actually mean. So when we want to print it out later, we can have a look at them. 
So what I'm going to say now is word underscore index equals in this case k uh, colon and then we're going to say what do you call it v plus three for k v in word underscore index dot items. So I might have been incorrect here. This doesn't actually give us the dictionary. This just gives us like tuples that have the string and the word in them, I believe. And then what we're doing here is we're going to say instead of C, sorry, this should be V. My apologies is we're going to get we're just break that tuple up into K and V, which stands for key and value. And the key will be the word. The value will be obviously the integer. Um, yes, that's what it will be. And we're going to say four word items and in index. We'll break that up. And then we're just going to add a bunch of different keys into our data set. Now, the reason we're going to start at plus three is because we're going to have actually one key or three keys that are going to be like special characters for our word mapping. And you guys will see how those work in a second. So I'm going to start by just saying word index. And in this case, I'm going to put in here uh, pad. And we're going to talk about this in a second. So don't worry if you guys are kind of like, what are you doing right now? And I'm going to say word index. And in this case, start equals one. I'm going to say word underscore index. And in this case, I believe it's like UNK. Yeah, that's correct. We're going to say UNK equals two. Now, UNK just stands for unknown. And I'm going to explain all this in a second, but it's easier just to type it out first. And we're going to say word index, in this case, inside this tag, unused. And we're going to say equals three. So, what I'm doing essentially is all of the words in our training and testing data set have. Um, like keys and values associated with them starting at one. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to add three to all of those values so that what I can actually do is assign my own kind of values that are going to stand for padding, start, unknown and unused. So that if we get values that are not valid, we can just assign them to this essentially in the dictionary. Now what I'm going to use for padding, you guys will see in just a second, essentially it's just so we can make our all our movie sets the same length. So we'll add this what's known as pad tag. And we'll do that by adding zero into our actual movie review list so that we're going to make each movie review the same length. And the way we do that essentially is that if they're not the same length, so maybe one's 100, maybe one's 200, we want all of them to be 200, the 100 length um, movie list will for what we'll do is we'll just add a bunch of padding to the end of it to make it length 200. And then obviously our model will hopefully be able to differentiate the fact that that is padding uh, and that we don't care about the padding and that we shouldn't even bother really like looking at that. Right. All right. So now what I'm going to do is add this kind of complicated line here uh, just to I don't even know why they have this to be quite honest. This is the way the TensorFlow has decided to do their like word mappings. But apparently you need to add this reverse underscore underscore word underscore index, which is equal to dictionary. And then in here we're going to say value comma key for key comma value uh, in word underscore index. I believe that's correct. And what this is going to do actually, sorry, not word index, word index dot items. What this is going to do is, okay, I understand now, <laughs> now that I've typed it out, is just swap all the values and the keys so that right now we actually have a dictionary that has all of the, uh, like the keys first, which is going to be the word and then the values where we actually want it the other way around. So we have like the integer pointing to the word because we're going to have our data set that is going to contain just integers like we've seen here. And we want these integers to be able to point to a word as opposed to the other way around. So what we're doing is just reversing this with a reverse word index uh, list just our dictionary. Sorry, essentially, that's what this is doing here. All right. Now that we've done that, the last step is just to add a function. And what this function will do is actually uh, decode essentially all of this training and testing data into human readable words. So there's different ways to do this. Again, I'm just going to take this right from the TensorFlow website because this part's not super important and I'd rather just, you know, do it quickly than spend too much time on it. So we're just going to say return blank string dot join. And in this case, we're going to say reverse word index dot get. In this case, we're going to say I comma question mark. Now what this does essentially, if you don't know how the get works is we're going to try to get index I, which we're going to define in a second. If we can't find a value for that, then what we'll do is just put question mark. And that, so which is a default value, which means we won't crash. If we're having like a key uh, error in our dictionary. And we're going to say for, in this case, I in um, 
text. I don't know why, where I have text typed. I think I might have messed something up here. So one second here. Oh, text array is the parameter. My apologies. So anyways, that's what this is going to do. It's just going to return to us essentially all of the, uh, the keys that we want or the human readable words, my apologies. So now what we'll do is we'll simply just print out the code review and I'm just gonna give it some test data. So let's say test, for example, zero, and I guess we're gonna have to do test underscore data. Doesn't really matter if you do train or test data, but let's just have a look at test data zero and see what that actually looks like. So let's run that. Uh, assuming I didn't make any mistakes, we should actually get some valid output in just a second. This usually takes a minute to run up. Uh, IMDB is not defined. What did I type here? Uh, I typed that as data, my apologies. So where we say IMDB, which is right here, we just need to replace that with data. Um, in my other file, I called it IMDB, so that's why I made the mistake there. But let's run that again, and hopefully now we will get some better looking output. So let's wait for this and see. Dict object has no attribute items. This needs to be items, classic typos by Tim. <laughs> One more time, third time is a charm, hopefully, let's see. And there we go. So now we can see that we're actually getting all of this decoded into, well, this text. Now I'll allow you guys to read through it, but you can see that we have these kind of keys that we've added. So start, which is one, which will automatically be added at the beginning of all of our text. And then we have these UNKs, which stand for unknown character essentially. And then we don't have any other keys in here, but say for example, we had like some padding we had added to this, we would see those pad tags as well in here. So that is essentially how that works. Uh, if you'd like to look at some other reviews, just mess around with kind of the values in the index here, throw them into decode review, and then we can actually see what they look like. Now, something to note quickly is that all reviews are different lengths. Now I've talked about this already, but let's just compare two reviews to really test that I am not just making this up. So I'm gonna say test underscore data, why would I have a capital here? Test underscore data zero. So the length of test underscore data zero and the length of let's try test underscore data one. Just to prove to you guys that these are actually different lengths, which means there's something kind of fancy we're gonna have to do with that padding tag, uh, which I was talking about there. So let's go into text class classification. Let's go CMD and then Python, in this case, tutorial 2.py. Uh, now, I guess we're going to get that output again, which is probably what's causing this to just take a second to run. But you can see that we have length 68 and we have length 260. Now, this is not going to work for our model. And the reason this doesn't work is because we need to know what our input sh shape sorry, and size is going to be. Just like I talked about before, we define the input nodes or the input neurons and the output neurons. So we have to determine how many input neurons there's going to be and how many output neurons there's going to be. Now, if we're like, we don't know how large our data is going to be, and it's different for each, uh, what do you call it, entry, then that's an issue. So we need to do something to fix that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this padding tag to essentially set a definite length for all of our data. Now, we could go ahead and pick the longest review and say that we'll make all of the reviews that length. But what I'm going to do is just pick an arbitrary number. In this case, we'll just do like 250 and say that that's the maximum amount of words we're going to allow in one review, which means that if you have more than 250 words in your review, we're just going to get rid of all those. And if you don't have 256 words or 250 words or whatever it is, we're just going to add these padding tags to the end of it until eventually we uh, reach that value. So the way to do this is again, using these fancy TensorFlow functions. Now, if you don't like these um, functions and like what these do for you and how they just kind of save you some time, go ahead and try to write them yourself. And if you want help on how to do that, feel free to reach out to me on Discord or in the comments or whatever. But I personally just use them because it saves me a quite, quite a bit of time in terms of like typing out the functions. And I already know how to do a lot of what these functions do. So for me, it doesn't really make sense to just retype them out when I can just use these kind of fancy tools. So what we're going to say is we're going to redefine our training and testing data. And what we're going to do is just trim that data so that it's only at or kind of normalize that data. So it's at 250 words. So to do that, I'm going to say train underscore data equals in this case, Keras dot pre processing. Um, no idea if that's how you spell it. We'll have to check that in a second. Dot sequence dot pad underscore sequence. Uh, so pre-processing, I think that's correct. I guess we'll see. And then in here, we have to define a few different parameters. So what we'll first do is we'll give that train underscore data. Uh, we're going to say value equals, which will be the pad value. So what we add to the end of 
in this case our numpy array to pad it per se and in this case we'll just use this pad tag so we'll say literally word index pad so let's copy that and put that there we're going to say our padding equals in this case post which just means we're going to pad after as opposed to before we also could uh pad before but that doesn't really make too much sense for this and then what we'll say is max uh in this case len equals and then you pick your number that you want to make all of the uh, values equal to now tensorflow did like 256 i'm just going to do 250 and see if this makes a difference in terms of our accuracy for the model and i'm literally just going to copy this and change these values now to test underscore data instead of train underscore data and this will do the same thing on our other data set uh oops didn't mean to do that so test underscore data like that so quick recap here because we are at 17 minutes now essentially what we've done is we've loaded in our data we've looked at our data we've created the word mappings essentially for our data so that we can actually figure out what all these integers mean we've created a little function here that will decode uh the mappings for us so we just pass it a word review that's integer encoded it decodes it and then it we can print that information out to the screen to have a look at it what we've just done now is we've done what's called pre-processing our data which means just making it into a form that our model can actually accept and that's consistent and that's what you're always going to want to do with any data that you have typically it's going to take you a bit more work than what we have because it's only two lines to pre-process our data because Keras kind of does it for us um, but for the purpose of this example that's fine all right so now that we've done that it's actually time to define our model um, now I'll show you quickly just to make sure that you know you guys believe me here that this is working in terms of pre-processing pre-processing our data so it's actually going to make things the same length so we'll say train underscore data test underscore data let me just print this out to the screen so python tutorial 2 uh, again we're going to get these integer mappings but we'll get the length at the end as well and another error of course we need to add an s to these sequences again my apologies guys on that um <laughs> classic typos here so anyways i had pre-processing -process sequence we need sequences uh, and now if i run this you can see that we have a length of 250 and 250 so we've kept that consistent now for some oh i'm printing i don't know why this is printing to oh it's because i'm printing it here and then i'm printing it here um, but you guys get the idea in that we've now made them actually the same size. So let me remove these print statements, um, all of them, so we can stop printing train data zero up here as well. And now let's start defining our model. So I'll just say model down here as a little comment just to help us out. So what I'm going to do now is similar to what I've done before, except in the last one, you might have noticed that the way I defined my model was... Uh, here, I'll show you in a second once I finish typing this. So we did keras.sequential, and then what we actually did was just had a list in here that had all the layers. That's fine, you can do that, but in this case, we're gonna have a few more layers. So what we're gonna do actually is add these uh, layers just by doing model.add. It's precisely the same thing as before, except instead of adding them in this list, we're just gonna do it using this method. So now we're gonna say keras.layers, in this case, embedding, and I'll talk about what these layers do in a second. So we're going to do 10,016, and then we're just going to actually copy this um, four times and just change these layers and the kind of uh, parameters as well. So now we're going to say global average pooling 1D, and then do that. And then we're going to add a dense layer here and another dense layer and change these parameters. So we'll say dense and we'll say in this case 16 and we'll say activation equals relu or rectify linear unit whatever you guys want to call it and then we'll do down here one and activation equals rectify linear unit as well um uh, actually sorry not relu, relu we're gonna do sigmoid my apologies so now we'll actually talk about the architecture of this model and how i came up with picking these layers and well what these layers are well, what we want essentially is we want the final output to be whether the review is good or whether the review is bad. I think I mentioned that um, at the beginning of the video. So what we're actually going to do is just have either that, like we'll have one output neuron and that neuron should be either zero or one or somewhere in between there to give us kind of a probability of like, we think it's like 20% one, 80% zero, something along those lines. Now we can accomplish that by using sigmoid. 
because what it will do again, we've talked about the sigmoid function is it'll squish everything. So whatever our value is in between zero and one, which will give us a nice way to test if our model is actually working properly um, and to get it the value that we want. Hey guys, so now it's time to talk about word embeddings and this embedding layer and then what the global average pooling 1D layer is doing. Now we already have an idea of what these dense layers are with these activation functions like ReLU and Sigmoid, but what we're actually going to do today, or I guess just in this video, is talk about the architecture of this network, kind of how it works on a high level understanding, and then in the next video what we'll do is actually get into training and using the network. So what I'm going to do first is just start by talking about these first two layers and specifically what this embedding layer is because it's very important. And then we will draw the whole network or the whole, I guess network is the right word, way to put it, the whole architecture and talk about how it fits together and what it's actually doing. So let's get started. Now, the easiest way to kind of explain this is to use an example of two very similar sentences. So I'm just going to say uh, the first sentence is have a great day and the next sentence will be have a good day now I know my handwriting is horrible so just give me a break on that um, it's also hard to kind of write with this tablet so that's my excuse but anyways these two sentences looking at them as human beings we can tell pretty quickly that they're very similar now yes great and good maybe one has more emphasis on having an amazing day whatever it is but they're very similar and they pretty well have the same meaning right maybe we know when we would use the sentence uh, and kind of the context in which like these words great and good are used and day and day and all this right it just we understand what they are now the computer doesn't have that same understanding at least right off the bat when looking at these two sentences now in our case, we've actually integer encoded all of our different values. So what we end up having, or all of our different words, sorry, is our sentences end up looking something like this. So we're gonna have this first word will represent a zero, a will be one, great will be two, and day will be three. So then down here we'll have zero, one. In this case, we're gonna say good is four, and day is three as well. So this means if we integer encode these sentences, we have some lists that look something like this. Now this one clearly is the first sentence, and this one down here will be the second sentence. Now, if we just look at this and we pretend that, you know, we don't even know what these words actually are, all we can really tell is the fact that two is different from four. Now, notice what I just said there. Two is different from four. When in reality, if we look at these two words, we know that they're pretty similar. Yes, they're different words. Yes, they're different lengths, whatever it is. But we know that they have a similar meaning. And the context in which they're used in this sentence is the same. Now, our computer obviously doesn't know that because all it gets to see is this. So what we want to do is try to get it to have an understanding of words that have similar meanings and to kind of group those together in a similar form or in a similar way. Because obviously in our application here of classifying movie reviews, the types of words that are used and the context in which they are used really makes a massive difference to trying to classify that as either a positive or a negative review. And if we look at great and good and we say that these are two completely different words, well, that's going to be a bit of an issue when we're trying to do some classification. So this is where our embedding layer comes in. Now, again, uh, just to say here one more time, like we know these are different, but we also would know, for example, say if we replace this four with a three, well, all our computer again would know is that two is different from three, just like four is different from two. It doesn't know how different they are. And that's what I'm trying to get at here is our embedding layer is going to try to group words in a similar kind of way so that we know which ones are similar to each other. So let me now talk about specifically the embedding layer. So let me just draw a little grid here. Now what our embedding layer actually does kind of like, I don't want to say the formal definition, but the more mathy definition is it finds word vectors for each word that we pass it, or it generates word vectors and uses those word vectors uh, to pass to the future layers. Now a word vector can be in any kind of dimensional space. Now in this case, we've picked 16 dimensions for each word vector, which means that we're going to have vectors, maybe something like this. And a vector again, is just a straight line with a bunch of different coefficients in some kind of space um, that is in this case, 16 dimensions. So let's pretend that this is a 16 dimensional vector. And this is the word vector for the word have. Now in our computer, it wouldn't actually be have, it would be zero because again, we have integer encoded stuff. 
but you kind of you get the point. So we'll say this is the word vector for half. Now, what we're going to do immediately when we create this embedding layer is let me actually get out of this quickly for one second is we initially create 10,000 word vectors for every single word and in this case every single number that represents a word. So what we're going to do is when we start creating this uh, embedding layer, we see that we have an embedding layer is we're going to draw 10,000 word vectors in just kind of some random way that are just there and each one represents one word. And what happens when we call the embedding layer is it's going to grab all of those word vectors for whatever input we have and use that as the data that we pass on to the next layer. Now, how do we create these word vectors and how do we group words? Well, this is where it gets into a bit complicated math. I'm not really going to go through any equations or anything like that, but I'll kind of give you an idea of how we do it. Now we want to, so let me get rid of this word have because this is not the best word vector example. And let's say that this word vector is great. Now upon creating our word vector, our embedding layer, we have two vectors. We have great and we have good. And we can see that these vectors are kind of far apart from each other. And we determine that by looking at the angle between them. And we say that this angle, maybe it's like, I don't know, 70 degrees or something like that. And we can kind of determine that great and good are not that close to each other. But in reality, we want them to be pretty close to each other. We want the computer to look at great and good and be like, these are similar words. Let's treat them similarly in our neural network. So what we want to do, hopefully, is have these words and these vectors kind of move closer together, whether it's good going all the way to great or great going all the way to good or vice versa. Right. We just want them to get close together and kind of be in some form of a group. So what we do is we try to look at the context in which these words are used rather than just the content of the words, which would just be what this looks like. We want to figure out how they how they're used. So we'll look at the words around it and determine that, you know, when we have a and day and a and day, maybe that means that these are like related in some way. And then we'll try to group these words. Now, it's way more complicated than that. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's kind of like a very basic way of how they group together is we look at the words that surround it um, and just different properties of the sentence involving that word. And then we can kind of get an idea of where these words go and which ones are close to each other. So maybe after we've done some training, uh, what happens is our word embeddings are what is known as learned, um, just like we're learning and teaching our neural network. And we get we end up getting great and good very close together. And these are what their word vector representations are. We can tell that they're close again by looking at the angle in between here. Maybe it's like 0 0.2 degrees. And what that means is these two vectors, which are just a bunch of numbers, essentially, are very close together. So when we feed them into our neural network, they should hopefully give us a, a similar output, at least for that specific neuron that we give it to. Now, I know this might be a little bit confusing, but I'm going to go. We're going to talk about this a bit more with another drawing of the whole network. But I hope you're getting the idea that the whole point of this embedding layer is to make word vectors that and then group those word vectors or kind of like make them close together based on words that are similar and that are different. So again, just like we would have great and good here, we would hope that a word vector like bad would be down here where it has a big difference from great and good so that we can tell that these words are not related whatsoever. All right, so that's how the embedding layer works. Now, what ends up happening when we have this embedding layer is we get an output dimension of what's known as 16 dimensions. And that's just how many coefficients essentially we have for our vector. So just like if you have a 2D line, so like if this is our grid in 2D and we say that this is X and this is Y, we can represent any line by just having like uh, some values like AX plus BY equals C. Now, this is the exact same thing that we can do in in n dimensions, which means like any amount of dimensions. So for a 16 dimensional line, I'm not going to draw them all, but we would start with like AX plus BY plus CZ plus DW and so on. And we would just have, again, 16 of these coefficients and then some kind of constant value. Uh, maybe we call it Lambda. That is like what it's what it equals to what the equation equals to. And that's how we define a line. I'm pretty sure I'm doing this correctly in uh, in n dimensions. So anyways, once we create that line, what we actually want to do is we want to scale the dimension down a little bit. Now, that's just because 16 dimensions is a lot of data, especially when we have like a ton of different words coming into our network. We want to scale it down to make it a little bit easier to actually um, compute and to train our network. 
So that's where this global average pooling 1D layer comes in. Now I'm not going to talk about this in too depth, in too much depth, but essentially the way to think of the global average pooling 1D is that it just takes whatever dimension our data is in and just puts it in a lower dimension. Now there's a specific way that it does that, but again, I'm not going to talk about that and it's not super important. If you care about that a lot, just look it up and it, it's not like crazy hard, but I just, I don't feel the need to go into it in this video. So anyways, let's now start drawing what our network actually looks like after understanding how this embedding layer works. So we're going to initially feed in a sequence and we'll just say that this is like our sequence of encoded words. Okay. So we'll say this is our input and maybe it's something like zero, seven, nine, like a thousand, two hundred, a thousand twenty. Uh, we have like nine again, maybe we have eight, like just a bunch of different essentially numbers, right? So we're going to pass this into our embedding layer. And all this is going to do is it's going to find the uh, representation of these words in our embedding layer. So maybe our embedding layer, well, it's going to have the same amount of words in our vocabulary. So it'll look up, say zero, it'll say maybe zero means zero's vector is like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and it goes to 16 dimensions, but I'm just going to do like two for this example here. Maybe seven, its vector is like seven and 9.0. And it just keeps going like this and it looks up all these vectors. So it takes all of our input data and it just turns them into a bunch of vectors and just spits those out into our next layer. Now our next layer, what this does is it just takes these vectors and just averages them out. And it just means it kind of shrinks them, their data down. So we'll do like a little smaller thing here and we'll just say um, like average. Okay. So we'll call this one embedding and that one is average. Now this average layer now is where we go into the actual neural network. Well, obviously this is a neural network, but we go into the dense layers, which will actually perform our classification. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with 16 neurons. And this is just, again, an arbitrary number that we've picked um, for our network. You can mess around with different values for this. And I encourage you to do that. But 16 is what TensorFlow decided to use and what I'm just following along with. So we're going to have 16 neurons. And we're going to pass all of our now 16 dimensional data or whatever dimensional data it is into these neurons like this. Now, this is where we start um, doing the dense layer. So we have this dense layer and this is connected to one output neuron like this. So what we end up having is this embedding layer, which is going to have all these word vectors that represent different words. We average them out we pass them into this 16 um, neuron layer that then goes into an output layer, which will spit out a value between zero and one using the sigmoid function, which I believe I have to correct myself because in other videos I said it did between negative one and one. It just takes any value we have and puts it in between zero and one like that. All right. So that is kind of how our network works. So let me talk about what this dense layer is doing just a little bit before we move on to the next video. So what this dense layer is going to attempt to do essentially is look for patterns of words and try to classify them using the same methods we talked about before uh, into either a positive review or a negative review. I'm going to take all these word vectors, which again are going to be like similarly grouped words like great, good are going to be similar input to this dense layer, right? Because we've um, averaged them out and embedded them and all this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to determine based on what words we have and what order they come in, what our text is. And we hope that this layer of 16 neurons is able to pick up on patterns of certain words and where they occur in the sentence and give us a accurate classification. Again, it's going to do that by tweaking and modifying these weights and all of the biases that are on, you know, all of these different, what do you call it? Layers or all of these connections or whatever they are. And then it's going to give us some output and some level of accuracy for our network. All right, so now it's time to compile and train our model. Now, the first thing that we have to do is just define the model, give it an optimizer, give it a loss function, and then I think we have to define uh, the metrics as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say model equals, in this case, uh, or sorry, not model equals, model.compile, if I spell compile correctly. And then here we're gonna say uh, optimizer. We're gonna use the Atom optimizer again. I'm not really gonna talk about what these are that much. If you're interested in the optimizer, just look them up. And then for the loss function, where you're going to use the binary underscore cross 
entropy. Now, what this one essentially is, is well, binary means like two options, right? And in our case, we want to have two options for the output neuron, which is zero or one. So what's actually happening here is we have the sigmoid function, which means our number is going to be between zero and one. But what the loss function will do is pretty well calculate the difference between, for example, say our output neuron is like 0 0.2 and the actual answer was zero. Well, it will give us a certain function that can calculate the loss. So how much of a difference 0 0.2 is from zero. Um, and that's kind of how that works. Again, I'm not going to talk about them too much. And they're not like, I mean, they are important, but not to really like memorize per se, like you kind of just mess with different ones. But in this case, binary cross entropy works well because we have two possible values, zero or one. So rather than using the other one that we used before, which I don't even remember what it was called, something cross entropy, we're using binary cross entropy. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna split our training data into two sets. And the first set of our training data is gonna be called validation data. Or really, I guess you can think of it as the second, the order doesn't really matter. But what we're gonna do is just get some validation data. And what validation data is, is essentially we can check how well our model is performing based on the tunes and tweaks we're doing on the training data on new data. Now, the reason we do that is so that we can get a more accurate sense of how well our model is because we're going to be testing new data to get the accuracy each time rather than testing it on data that we've already seen before, which again means that the model can't simply just memorize each review and give us either a zero or a one for that. It has to actually have some degree of I don't know, like thinking or operation so that it can work on new data. So what we're going to do is we're going to say X underscore Val equals, and all we're going to do is just grab the train data. Uh, and we're just going to cut it to a uh, thousand or 10,000 entries. So there's actually 25,000 entries or I guess reviews in our training data. So we're just going to take 10,000 of it and say, we're going to use that as validation data. Now, in terms of the size of validation data, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, this is what uh, TensorFlow is using. So I'm just kind of going with that. But again, mess with these numbers and see what happens to your model. Everything with our neural networks and machine learning really is going to come down to very fine. What's known as hyper parameters or like hyper tuning. Uh, which means just changing individual parameters each time until we get a model that is, well, just better and more accurate. So we're going to say that X val equals that, but then we're also going to have to modify our X train data uh, to be train underscore data. And in this case, we're just going to do the other way around. So 10,000 colon. Now I'll just copy this and we're just going to replace this again with instead of test, uh, actually, oh, we have to do this with labels. Sorry. What am I thinking? So we're just going to train, change this to be labels. And then instead of X val, it's just going to be Y value and then Y train. Um, so yeah, we're not touching the test data because we're going to use all that test data to test our model. And then we're just going to use the, uh, the training stuff or the validation data to validate the model. All right. So now that we've done that, it is actually time to fit the model. So I'm just going to say, uh, like fit <laughs> model and you'll see why I'd name this something different in a second is going to be equal to model dot fit. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say X underscore train, Y underscore train. We're going to say epochs uh, is equal to, I think that's how you spell it, 40. And again, you can mess with this number and see what we get based on that. And we're going to say batch underscore size equals 512, which I'll talk about in a second. And then finally, we're going to say validation underscore data equals. And in here, we're going to say uh, X underscore val, Y underscore val. And I think that's it. Let me just check here quickly. Oh, one last thing that I forgot to do. We're going to say verbose equals one verbose equals one. Now I'm not going to lie. I honestly don't know what verbose is. I probably should have looked it up before the video, but I have no idea what that is. So if someone knows, please let me know. But the batch size is essentially how many, what do you call it? Um, movie reviews we're going to do each time or how many we're going to load in at once. Because this thing is, it's kind of, I mean, we're loading all of our reviews into memory, but in some cases we won't be able to do that. And we won't be able to like feed the model, all of our reviews on each single cycle. So we just set up a batch size, uh, that's going to define essentially how many at once we're going to give. And I know I'm kind of horribly explaining what a batch size is, um, but we'll get into more on batch sizes and how we can kind of do like buffering through our data and like going, taking some from a text file and reading into memory in later videos when we have like hundreds of gigabytes of data that we're going to be working with. Okay. So finally we're going to say results equals. And in this case, I believe it is 
model dot evaluate. And then we're going to evaluate this obviously on our test data. So we're going to give it test data and test labels. So test underscore data, test underscore labels like that. And then finally, what I'm going to do is just actually print out the results so we can see what our accuracy is. So say print results um, and then get that value. So let me run this quickly. Neural networks, text classification. Let's go CMD and then Python text uh, or that's not even the one we're using. We're using tutorial too. sorry. And let's see what we get with this. This will take a second to run through the epoch. So I'll fast forward through that so you guys don't have to wait. All right, so we just finished doing the epochs now, and essentially our accuracy was 87%. Uh, and this first number, I believe, is the loss, which is 0 0.33. And then you can see that actually um, here we get the accuracy values. And notice that the accuracy from our last epoch was actually greater than the accuracy on the test data, which again shows you that. Sometimes, you know, when you test it on new data, you're going to be getting a less accurate model. Or in some cases, you might even get a more accurate model. It really just, you can't strictly go based off of what you're getting on your training data. You really do need to have some test and validation data to make sure that the model's correctly working. So that's essentially what we've done there. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's the model we, we tested and it's 87% accurate. So now let's actually have, let's interpret some of these results a little bit better and let's show some reviews. Let's do a prediction on some of the reviews and then see like if this, our model kind of makes sense for what's going on here. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to actually just copy some output that I have here. Um, just to save us a bit of time because I am going to wrap up the video in a minute here, but essentially what this does, it just takes the first uh, review from test data, uh, gets the model to predict that because we obviously we didn't train it on the test data, so we can do that fine. We're going to say review and then we print out the decoded review. We're going to print out what the model predicted and then we're going to print out what the actual label of that was. So if I run this now, I'll fast forward through the kind of training process and we will see the other. All right, so this is what essentially our review looks like. So at least the one that we were testing it on and you can see that we have this little start tag and it says, please give this one a miss for, and then BR stands for like break line or go to the next line. So we could have actually added another tag for BR uh, if we noticed that this was used a lot in the review, uh, but we didn't do that. So you see BR. Uh, unless this is actually part of the review, but I feel like that should be like break line in terms of HTML anyways. Uh, and then we have some unknown characters, which could be anything that we just didn't know what it was. And it says, and the rest of the cast rendered terrible performances. The show is flat, 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 BR, BR. I don't know how uh, Michael Madison could have allowed this one on his plate. He almost seemed he, what is it? Seemed to know this wasn't going to work out and his performance was quite unknown. So all, yeah. So anyways, you can see that this probably had like some emojis in it or something. And that's why we have all these unknowns. And then obviously we made this review, which was pretty short to be the full length of 250 so we see all these pads that did that for us and then we have a prediction and an actual value of zero so we did end up getting this one correct now i think it'd be interesting actually to write your own review and test it on this so in the next video what i'm going to do is show you how we can save the model to avoid doing like all of this every time we want to run the code because realistically we don't want to wait like a minute or two before we can predict uh, a movie review every time we just want it to happen instantly and we definitely can do that. I just haven't showed that yet in the series because that's kind of in like later what you do after you learn machine learning. Um, and obviously like this, this model trained pretty quickly. Like we only had about, uh, what was it? Like 50,000 test data set, which I, it seems like a large number, but it's really not, especially when you're talking about string data. So in future videos, we're going to be training uh, models that take like maybe a few days to train. Um, at least that's the goal or maybe a few hours or something like that. So in that case, you're probably not going to want to train it every time before you predict some information. So that'll be useful to know how to save that. So in today's video, what we're going to be doing is talking about saving and loading our models. And then we're going to be doing a prediction on some data that doesn't come from this actual data set. Now, I know this might seem kind of trivial. We already know how to do predictions, but trust me when I tell you this is a lot harder than it looks because if we're just taking in string data, that means we have to actually do the encoding, all of the pre-processing, removing certain characters, 
making sure that that data looks the same as the data that our neural network is expecting, which in this case is a list of encoded numbers, right? Or of encoded words that is essentially just numbers. So what we're going to do to start is just save our model. So let's talk about that now. So up until this point, every time we've wanted to make a prediction, we've had to retrain the model. Now on small models like this, that's fine. You have to wait a minute, two minutes, but it's not very convenient when you have models that maybe take you days, weeks, months, years to train, right? So what you want to do is when you're done training the model, you want to save it, or sometimes you even want to save it like halfway through a training process. This is known as checkpointing the model so that you can go back and continue to train it later. Now in this video, we're just going to talk about saving the model once it's completely finished. But in future videos, when we have larger networks, we will talk about checkpointing and how you do, how to load your or train your model in like batches with different size data and all that. So what I'm going to start by doing is just actually bumping the vocabulary size of this model up to 88,000. Now, the reason I'm doing that is just because for our next exercise, which is going to be making predictions on outside data, we want to have as many words in our model as possible so that when it gets kind of some weirder words that aren't that common and knows what to do with them. Uh, so I've done a few tests and I noticed that with the, what do you call it, with the vocabulary size bumped up, it performs a little bit better. So we're going to do that. So anyways, we bumped the vocabulary size. And now after we train the model, we need to save it. Now to save the model, all we have to do is literally type the name of our model, in this case model, dot save, and then we give it a name, so in this case let's call it model dot h5. Now h5 is just like an extension that uh, means, uh, I don't know, it's like, it, I honestly don't know why they use h5, but <laughs> it's the extension for a saved model in Keras and TensorFlow, so we're just going to work with that. And that's as easy as this is. It is just going to save our model in binary data, which means we'll be able to read it in really quickly and use the model when we want to actually make predictions. So let's go ahead and run this now. And then we're going to have the model saved. And then from now on, we won't have to continually train the model when we want to make predictions. I'm going to say Python tutorial two, and I'll be right back once this finish, finishes running. All right, so the model is finished training. Notice that our accuracy is slightly lower than it was in the previous video. Really kind of a negligible difference here. Uh, but anyways, just notice that because we did bump the vocabulary size. So anyways, now that we've saved the model, we actually don't have to go through this tedious process every time we run the code of creating and training and fitting the model. And in fact, we don't actually need to save it as well either here to load our model in now that it's saved. And you can see the file right here with all this, uh, this big massive binary blob here. Uh, all we have to do to load this in is just type one line. Now the line is whatever the name of your model is, it doesn't matter, I'm just gonna call it model, is equal to, in this case, keras.models.load underscore model. And then here you just put the name of that file. So in this case, model.h5. Now, what's really nice about this as well is you can actually train a bunch of different models and tweak like hyper parameters of them and only save the best one. And what I mean by that is like maybe you mess with, for example, the amount of neurons in the second activation layer uh, or something like that or in the second hidden layer. And then you train a bunch of models, you figure out which one has the highest accuracy and then you only save that one. That's nice as well. And that's something you could do like overnight. You could run like your script for a few hours, train a bunch of models, figure out which one is the best only save and then use that one. So anyways, we're going to load in this model. Notice that I've actually just commented out this aspect down here because we're not going to use this anymore. And now what we're going to start doing is actually training or testing the model on some outside data. So I've gone ahead and picked a movie review for one of my favorite movies. Some of you guys can read this if you want, uh, but it's The Lion King. Absolutely love that movie. So I've decided to go with this. This review was a 10 out of 10 review. So a positive review. And we're going to test our model on this one. Now, I actually did take this off like the IMDB website or whatever that's called. Um, but the data set that they use is different. So this is you guys will see why this works a little bit differently and what we have to do with this. So this is in a text file. So what I'm going to do is load in the text file here in code and then get that big blob, that string and convert it into a form that our model can actually use. So the first step to do this obviously is to get that string. So we're going to say with open. And in this case, I've called my file test.txt. And then I'm just going to set the encoding because I was running into some issues here. You guys probably don't have to do this. I was going to say UTF hyphen eight, which is just kind of the standard text encoding. And we're going to say as F. Now, again, the reason I use with is just because that means I don't have to close the file afterwards. Um, 
better practice if you want to use that. And now I'm going to say for line in f dot read lines, which essentially just means we're going to get each line. In this case, we only have one line, but if we wanted to throw in a few more uh, reviews in here and do some predictions on those, that would be very easy to do by just keeping this code structure, just throw another line in there. And now I'm just going to say, we're going to grab this line and we're going to start pre-processing it so that we can actually feed it to our model. Now notice that this, when we read this in, all we're going to get is a large string, but that's no good to us. We actually need to convert this into an encoded uh, list of numbers, right? And essentially we need to say, okay, so of that's a word, what number represents that? Put that in a list. Same with all, same with the, same with animation, right? And we keep going and keep going. Um, pretty well for all of the words in here. And we also have to make sure that the size of our text is only at max 250 words, because that's what we were using when we were training the data. So it's expecting a size of that. And if you give it something larger, that's not going to work or it might, but you're going to get a few errors with that. So anyways, the first step here is I'm going to say n line is equal to line dot, and I'm going to remove a bunch of characters that I don't want. So I'm just going to say dot replace. I think this is the best way to do it, but maybe not. Um, and I'm going to replace all of the commas, all of the periods, all of the brackets and all of the colons. And I'll talk about more why we want to do that in just one second. So we'll do dot replace. I guess this dot replace should probably be outside the bracket. Uh, and then we'll replace with a bracket with nothing. And I know this is there probably is a better way to do this, but for our purposes, it's not really that important. And finally, we will replace all our colons with nothing as well. Now, again, the reason I'm doing this is because let's go here. If you have a look, for example, when we split this, because we're just going to split this data by um, spaces and to get all the words, what will end up happening is we're going to get words like company comma. We're going to get words like I'm trying to find something that has a period like art dot and then a quotation mark. Right. And we don't want those uh, to be words in our list because there's no mapping for art period. There's only a mapping for art, which means that I need to remove all of these kind of symbols so that when we split our data, we get the correct words. Now there'll be a few times where the split doesn't work correctly, but that's okay. Uh, as long as the majority of them are working well, same thing with brackets, right? I can't have irons and then a closing bracket is one of my words. So I need to get rid of that. Now this reminds me, I need to remove quotation marks as well because they use quite a few of those in there. I don't know why I closed that document. Uh, so let's do that as well with one last replace. So say dot replace in this case, we'll actually just do backslash quotation mark. Uh, and then again with nothing. Now I'm adding a dot strip here to get rid of that backslash n. And now we're going to say dot split. And in this case, we'll split out of space. Now I know this is a long line, uh, but that's all we need to do to remove everything. And now we actually need to encode and trim our data down to 250 words. So to encode our data, I'm going to say encode equals in this case, uh, and we're just literally, we'll make a function called like review underscore encode and we'll pass in our N line. Now what review and code will do is look up the mappings for all of the words and return to us an encoded list. And then finally, what we're going to do, and we'll create this function in just a second. Don't worry. It doesn't already exist is we're actually going to use what we've done up here with this test data, train data, care as pre-processing stuff. And we're just going to apply this to, in this case, our encoded data. So we add those pad tags or we trim it down to what it needs to be. So in this case, we'll say encode equals Kara's dot pre processing instead of train data, we'll just pass in this case, actually a list and then encode inside it, because that's what it's expecting uh, to get a list of lists. All right, so now that we've done that, uh, our final step would be to use the model to actually make a prediction. So we're going to say model dot predict. And then in this case, we'll pass it simply this encode right here, which will be in the correct form. Now we'll save that under predict. Uh, and then what we'll do is just simply print out the model. So we'll say print or not the model. Sorry, we'll print the original text, which will be the review. So in this case, we'll print line and then we will print out the encoded review just so we can have a look at what that is. And then finally, we'll print the prediction. So what whether the model thinks it's positive or negative. So we'll just say predict. And in this case, we'll just put zero because we're only going to be doing um, like one at a time, right? Okay, sweet. So now the last thing that we need to do is just simply write this review encode function and then we'll be good to go and start actually using our model. So I'm just going to say define review underscore encode. This is going to take a string. We'll just call that S uh, lowercase s 
And what we're going to do in here is set up a new list that we're going to append some stuff into. So I'm just going to say like return, uh, let's just say like encoded equals. And then I'm going to start this with one. Now, the reason I start one in here is because all of our data here uh, where it starts has a one. So we're just going to start with one uh, because we won't have added that in from uh, the other way. I hope you guys understand that. Just we're setting like a starting tag to be consistent with the rest of them. And now what we're going to do is we're going to loop through every single word that's in our S here, which will be passed in as a list of words. We'll look up the numbers associated with those words and add them into this encoded list. So we're going to say for word. And in this case, we're going to say word in S. Now we'll say if word in this case, word underscore index. And again, we're going to use word underscore index as opposed to reverse word index because word index stores all of the words corresponding to the letters or not the letters, the numbers, which means that we can literally just throw our data into word index and it'll give us the uh, number associated with each of those words. So we're going to say if word in word index, then we'll say encoded dot append. And in this case, we'll simply append in this case, word index word. Now, otherwise, what we'll do is we'll say encoded dot append to. Now, what will happen is we're going to check here if word if the word is actually in our vocabulary, which is represented by word index, which is just a dictionary of all the words corresponding to all the numbers that represent those words. Now, if it's not, what we'll do is we'll add in that unknown tag so that the program knows that this is an unknown word. Otherwise, we'll simply add the number associated with that word. Now, one last thing to do is actually just do word dot lower here, just to make sure that if we get any words that have some weird capitalization, um, they are still found in our vocabulary. So like words at the beginning of a sentence and stuff like that. Uh, and now with that being done, I believe we're actually finished and ready to run this code. So what's nice about this is now that we've saved the model, we don't have to train it again. So I can literally just run this and it should happen fairly quickly. Fingers crossed. Let's see. All right, must be a list of iterables found non iterable object. So what error is that here? Uh, encode, 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 encode. All right, so print review encode. Ah, well, it would be helpful if I returned <laughs> the encoded list. And that would have been our issue there. So let's run that one more time and see what we're getting there. And there we go. Sweet. So this is actually the review. I know it's very, really hard to read here, but if you guys want to go ahead and read it, feel free. Since it's on the Lion King, it's obviously a positive review. And then you can see this is what we've ended up with. So our review has been translated into this, which means we've actually trimmed quite a bit of the review. And you can see that wherever it says two, that is actually a word that we didn't know or that wasn't in our vocabulary. Four represents the, that's why there's a lot of fours. And then all the other words have their correspondence, right? Uh, now, fortunately for us, we picked a 88,000 vocabulary, which means that we can get indexes like 20,000, whereas before it would have all been under 10,000. And you can see that our prediction here is now 96% um, positive, which means that obviously like we were going between zero where zero is uh, a negative review and one is a positive review. So this classified correctly as very positive review. And we could try this on all other kinds of reviews and see what we get. But that is how you go about kind of transforming your data into the form that the network expects. And that's where I'm trying to get you guys at right now is to understand that, yes, it's really easy when we're doing it with um, this kind of data that just comes in like IMDB, like Kara's low data. But as soon as you actually have to start using your own data, there's a quite a bit of manipulation that you have to do and things that you might not think about when you're actually feeding it to the network. And in most cases, you can probably be sure that your network is not actually the thing that's happening incorrectly, but it's the data that you're feeding it is not in the correct form. Um, and it can be tricky to figure out what's wrong with that data. So with that being said, that has been it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. That's gonna wrap up the text classification aspect here of neural networks. Hey guys, so in today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to install TensorFlow 2.0 GPU version on an Ubuntu slash Linux machine. Now this should work for any version of Linux or any Linux operating system, although the one I am going to be showing you on is Ubuntu 18.0.4. Now you may notice that I'm actually on a Windows machine right now and that this is actually just an Ubuntu terminal that's open. Now I'm actually just SSH'd into a server that I have that contains two 1080 graphics cards, so GTX 1080s, and that's 
how I'm going to be showing you how to do this. Now quickly, if you don't understand the difference between the CPU and the GPU version, the CPU version is essentially just way slower. And you would only really use the CPU version if you don't have a graphics card in your computer that is capable of running TensorFlow 2.0 GPU. So quickly, before we go forward and you guys get frustrated with not being able to install this, make sure that you have a graphics card that actually works for this program or for this module. That means you have to have a graphics card that is a GTX 1050 Ti or higher. Those are the ones that are listed on TensorFlow's website as compatible with TensorFlow 2.0 GPU. If you want to have a quick thing without having to go to the website to see if yours works, if it has four gigs of video RAM and is a GTX generation card or higher, it most likely works with TensorFlow 2.0. Now, I don't know about all the different cards, but if you have any questions, leave them below. I'll try to answer that for you. But any 1060, 1070, 1080 or RTX cards, that have CUDA cores on them will work for this. Essentially, you just need a CUDA enabled GPU so you can check if yours meets that requirement before moving forward. Now to do this, I'm just going to be following the steps listed on the TensorFlow website. Now you may run into some issues while doing this, um, but for Ubuntu, this is pretty straightforward and I'm essentially just going to be copying these commands and pasting them in my terminal. Now, if you'd like to just try to do this without following along with video, go ahead, but I will be kind of showing you some fixes that I ran into while I was doing this. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So actually, let me just split the screen up so we can have a look at both of them at once. I'm in my uh, Linux machine right now. You just have to get to the terminal. You notice that I don't even have a desktop and I'm literally just going to start copying and pasting these commands. Now, the first thing that we need to install is actually um, CUDA. Now, CUDA is what allows us to use the CUDA cores on our GPU to actually run the code. So just go ahead and keep copying these commands. It will take a second. And I actually already have this installed on my machine. So I'm going to go through the steps with you guys. But again, if anything is different on my machine, that's probably because it's already installed. So if you don't know how to copy it into a window like this, um, you just right click on your mouse and it'll copy if you're using a server like I am. Um, but anyways, we'll just go through all of these and <laughs> keep going. Now I will have all these commands listed in my description as well. And that should show you guys you know, if the website goes down at any point, you can just copy it from there as well. So yeah, literally just keep going. All we're doing here is adding NVIDIA packages. We're going to make sure we have the NVIDIA drivers for our graphics card that are correct. And then we're going to go ahead and install TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, so yeah, just go through these commands. There's not really much for me to say as I copy these in and eventually we will get through them all. All right. So now we're going to install the NVIDIA driver. You can see that's all commented out on this TensorFlow website here. Copy that and again, just continue to go. I don't really have any commentary for you guys here. So we'll copy this. This is going to install obviously the development and runtime libraries, which we need. And it says minimum four gigs or approximately four gigabytes, which will mean that's how long it, how many gigabytes is going to take up on a machine. So this will take a second uh, and I'll fast forward through these stuff if it does take a while. Finally, we're going to install tensor RT. I don't even know what this is, but apparently it's required. And then after we're done this, we should actually be finished installing everything that we need for TensorFlow 2.0 to work. Again, if you guys want to go through this, just go to the website, copy all of these commands in order, paste them into here, and they should work properly. Now, finally, what we have to do is actually install TensorFlow 2.0. So we've got all of the dependencies installed. And now to install TensorFlow 2.0, we're just going to say pip3 install TensorFlow. And then I believe we're going to say hyphen GPU and then equals equals 2.0 point. I got to find it up here to make sure that we do it correctly. 2.0.0 hyphen alpha zero like that. So then we'll do that and that should install TensorFlow 2.0 for us. Now I already have this installed, but this will actually take a few minutes to install because there is quite a bit of stuff that it needs to download on your computer. So anyways, that has been it for installing TensorFlow 2.0 on your computer using the GPU version. Again, throughout the rest of the neural network series, I'm going to be going forward doing this on an Ubuntu machine. So running all of the code, I'll do the development in Windows, um, throw the files on my server, train the model, train the models, excuse me, and then take the models off and um, use them on my Windows machine. So if you want to validate if this is working, you can really quickly just do Python three in Linux, and then you can say do import TensorFlow and doing that, you shouldn't get any errors. And if you don't get any errors, then you have successfully installed TensorFlow 2.0. Now, a few errors here, if you guys are still listening and stuff wasn't working, 
If for some reason when you install TensorFlow and you notice that it's not using your GPU, go ahead and uninstall the CPU version of TensorFlow. So just pip3 un uninstall and then TensorFlow and I guess you'd have to just do uh, just TensorFlow like that and that will install the CPU version if it is installed in your machine. So anyways, that has been it for how to install TensorFlow 2.0 GPU version on Ubuntu. Pretty straightforward, just go through, copy these commands, and if you guys have any questions or errors, please just leave them in the comments below, and I will try my best to help you out.